Good morning, and thank you for joining us today for the fourth Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force meeting. We are coming to you today on Zoom and on the FAA's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter live streams. For any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions offer background only. A video archive of the event will be available on the FAA's social media accounts after the meeting ends. Now, I will read the Federal Advisory Committee Act official statement. This meeting is being held pursuant to a notice published in the Federal Register on August the 10th, 2021. The agenda for the meeting was announced in that notice, which details as set out in the agenda is posted on the FAA committee website. I am the designated federal officer responsible for compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act under which the meeting is conducted. It is my responsibility to see to it that the agenda is adhered to and that accurate minutes are kept. I also have the responsibility to adjourn the meeting should I find it necessary to do so in the public interest. Only Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force members may participate in any discussions and vote on matters put to a vote by the chair. Now, at this time, I would like to provide an update on the charter. I am pleased to announce that the Secretary of the, of the Department of Transportation renewed the charter, which allows the task force to continue meeting to work on drafting a recommendation report. A copy of the charter is also available on the FAA committee website. Now I will turn it over to the chair. Thanks so much, Angela. And uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I wanted to start with a thank you. Uh, I know as we were talking about just a few minutes ago, the pandemic has, has not ceased and life has gotten not any easier <laughs> in the last 18 months. And yet you have continued to do the work of the task force. And so I know that this is a, this is a heavy lift um, and you're trying to squeeze this into the things that you already all do. And I know you wouldn't be on this committee if you weren't already very busy people. So I just wanted to say thank you again for your incredible volunteer work and for the work that you're doing day in and day out on putting together what I think will be a really terrific report. Um, I'm really pleased with the work that's being done so far. Um, I know we're in the data gathering and we're going to hear more about that today. You know, I think if anything, right, how critical the work is that we're doing right now has only become more apparent, right? If, as some of you have started to venture into the world as I have, um, climate change and workforce pipeline are kind of duking it out for the top issue. <laughs> um, they seem to be neck and neck with every conversation. And so that just points to the really critical need for, for the work that we're doing. You know, we've talked about the fact that, you know, while the industry has been going through a really difficult time, we've also seen some people leave the industry in higher numbers than we previously thought. And so the demand has just been incredible. I will tell you from um, just my standpoint at the college, uh, we are seeing companies um, come at us you know, we never see companies in September, right? They usually wait for us to get started. Um, and we've had four or five visits already on campus from uh, leading manufacturers, airlines. I mean, the demand has just been incredible. And at the same time, you know, students uh, from low socioeconomic backgrounds are really suffering, right? And our, our work is really important in terms of bringing more underrepresented uh, individuals to our industry. And we know that finances plays a significant role in that. I'll just give you a quick example. So we have a student emergency assistance fund where we cut $250 checks to students for anything but tuition. And in a normal year, we'd usually see about 25 requests. Since the pandemic started, we've had 300. And that's on a population of, you know, roughly 1500 students. And it's been mostly for things like rent and food, right? So this just gives you a sense of, you know, the kind of need that students are really in right now as they make the decision between, you know, tuition and um, and working, right? So, um, so this is why we do the work that we do right now. So to the structure for day, today is we're gonna, you know, have the subcommittees report out um, about where they're at right now as we continue to look at developing some great recommendations. Um, I've been meeting with the subcommittee chairs, you know, over the last, throughout the course, but, you know, particularly in the last 
six or eight weeks. And I know that we've been talking about the, you've been talking about the November 15th deadline to get us recommendations. And I'm just telling you right now, I know there's going to be slippage. So, you know, you can all breathe a sigh of relief. Uh, we'll keep talking about it. I get it. There's a lot going on and, and um, aviation is very busy in October and November. So uh, we'll keep talking about it. Okay. Um, and I also wanted to make sure everybody knew that I recognize we're going to probably need some additional working group sessions, um, particularly around the one stop shop idea and the funding ideas. So just know that I'm, I'm very sensitive to that and we'll make sure that those get on the schedule as well. Um, you know, I'm hoping that most folks um, that we work through a lot of these issues um, as we move towards um, final recommendations in March. So let's see where the conversation takes us today too, in terms of timing as well. And then we're gonna uh, have a really nice conversation with uh, about museums and the role they play in the aviation ecosystem and, and creating and building awareness for the workforce pipeline. Okay, um, last thing I need to do is uh, get a motion to accept the minutes um, from our last public meeting. Can I get a- to accept. Thank you, and a second. Second. Okay, so we have a, a motion from Yvette, a second from Whitney. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections? Aye. Any objections? And any abstentions? Okay, terrific. Uh, motion passes to accept the minutes. All right, as we typically do, we start out with Yvette. Take it away. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to share my screen here. So, a second, and I'll run through these slides with. Can everybody see? Okay. Um, so, yes, we are the Trends Subcommittee, um, and I will run through some of these slides along with my fellow subcommittee members. We'll, we'll run through this presentation as an update from our last public meeting. Why is it working? Okay, stand by. Of course, this will happen. <laughs> Let me try that again. My apologies. Don't panic about <laughs> Let me try. Well, if I resume my slides. Okay, there we go. Um, so these are our members. Um, I'm Yvette Rose, president of the Aero Club Foundation of Washington and the chair of the committee. We have Casey Herzberg. She's director of engineering for aircraft data fusion. Brett Levanto, vice president of operations for the Aeronautical Repair Station Association. And Sid Smith, school counselor at Elkins Park, Chetelham School District in Pennsylvania. Our FA subject matter experts, Jim Bro, analyst at ABSED, and Christina Jurett, manager of aviation workforce and education. I'm going to just pause there for a minute and say a quick word about their um, participation. Has it, they have just really dedicated themselves to meeting with our subcommittee um, at every meeting, and their guidance and just wealth of expertise has proven really um, to provide a lot of good insight. Um, for our work. Um, you know, oftentimes when you have FAA folks on understanding this is an advisory task force and these are recommendations and discussions that we're bringing forth, they have just the right balance to be able to sit on the committee with us, um, provide their insight and guidance without, you know, sort of um, stopping our work or in any way, you know, guiding the conversation. They just have really been um, an excellent partner. So I just wanted to extend my thank you and appreciation to them. This is our task. Um, every time we like to kind of just refresh what we're here to, to do, um, our task is to identify industry trends that encourage or discourage youth in the United States from pursuing careers in aviation. Um, so it's sort of the broad first step. And I'm gonna turn it over to Casey next. Thank you, Yvette. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here this morning, continuing this conversation. Quick update on our subcommittee. Um, since June, as we have from the beginning, we have continued to meet weekly along with our FA subject matter experts, as Yvette just said, Jim and Christina, who've been there with us every single week 
providing their valuable insight and knowledge. And as the vet said, we're very grateful to have them working alongside of us. Um, we've also continued to meet with the other subcommittees since June. And as we've all discussed before, there's a lot of overlap. So the more brainstorming we can do, the better. And all that discussion and collaboration is just very helpful as we continue to form our recommendations. Um, finally, you know, as we mentioned at our last public meeting, we were going to be developing an educator survey. So a quick recap on why we were developing the educator survey was in our last student survey or youth survey, as we you know sometimes called it, um, that survey really confirmed the importance of the role the teacher played in the development of career exploration, um, exposure to different career options. Teachers are a key influencer, um, sometimes, you know, arguably one of the more important key influencers in a child's life, but definitely a key influencer when it comes to igniting student interest and promoting career awareness um, throughout their schooling. Teachers are working with our target group every single day, so they are crucial to helping us develop that future pipeline of talent and igniting that interest in aviation and aerospace um, career options. The survey also revealed that um, educators need more resources and Sid is gonna go into more detail on that next. But basically the next logical step was to hear directly from the educators on what they currently do in the classroom, what do they need, basically you know, dive deeper into what is happening out there what is needed and, and where is it needed? Maybe, you know, different parts of the country um, for these educators. So we developed a survey that targets just educators, K through post-secondary. We do have an admin checkbox um, on this survey as well, in case we get those superintendents or higher level admin answering the survey, because it would be really great to, you know, get this um, from the top down and, and get this in there. But um, you know, the gathering of this information from these educators will really help impact our next step. So we developed uh, a Google form survey. It's about four, it's 14 questions and it takes about five minutes to complete. And um, just a quick key highlights of some of the questions. So for example, we've asked educators if they engage in aviation, aerospace, career exploration or awareness in the classroom with their students. If they answered yes, we'd like to know which careers are explored, and we have uh, 11 different categories. If they answered yes or no, we do ask them to explain a little bit more about why or why not they engage in career exploration in the classroom. We ask them to describe their level of knowledge of different careers, maybe the pathways, and their knowledge on available resources that are out there for them. We've also asked them what resources they would need as an educator to get more aviation aerospace education in the classroom. And Sid's gonna go into more detail on that one next because that's a very, very important one. Um, we have a section in there to list any further suggestions they may have as the educator, as the expert on how more aviation aerospace education could be introduced into the educational environment as a whole. And then finally, we do have some questions in there that are going to allow us to parse this data out by geographic and demographic location, type of school, you know, is it public, private, charter, who's answering this, this survey, and then which grade level grouping is also answering this survey. So for more information on the role of the educator and our distribution process, I'll turn it over to our resident in-house um, subject matter expert, Sid. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Casey. Uh, so glad to be here again. Uh, this has been a great task force and a definitely an awesome uh, subcommittee to work with. Um, yes, our teachers are definitely a valuable resource. And whether you're talking about primary teachers, secondary teachers, uh, as well as post-secondary teachers, we do know that teachers are the key to the pipeline vision. You know, as Casey indicated, our teachers are in a unique position. They're in a unique position to interact and to influence students' career paths on a day-to-day -day basis. So along with the questions that Casey highlighted, we also wanted to explore what support teachers would specifically need to implement the aviation and aerospace education in their classrooms. So we are asking them to check off boxes if they need professional development, financial support, time, curriculum, administration support, if they need parent guardian support, 
or even if they need aviation aerospace industry engagement, as well as just a checklist of maybe a wish list of things that they may need. But we felt it very important to hear from the teachers on specific things that they need, because sometimes you can talk about implementation, but we also know that it's equally important uh, to get uh, specific feedback on exactly what they need in order to get the job done. Uh, we have received some amazing feedback thus far. However, we do welcome any ideas from the task force on how to distribute to a greater uh, teacher audience. Uh, we have reached out to local as well as national educational organization, but uh, we definitely could use the support of the task force to maybe go through your contact list and uh, share our survey with any uh, teachers that uh, you have in your contact list. We just want to make sure that we get uh, a nice range of uh, teacher input from across the country uh, in order to extrapolate uh, some good recommendations. Um, so uh, any help and any uh, suggestions, uh, again, we definitely welcome in order to distribute that survey. Uh, we have also continued our conversation on parent engagement. We know that parent engagement is very, very important. Uh, so we are definitely continuing that conversation. Um, I'll now turn it over to Brett, uh, who has a wealth of information to share with us on collaboration, uh, as, well, as well as some um, recommendations. Like you said, actually wealth of information. Um, I don't know if I can live up to that specifically, but it's a great pun uh, for our transition because I wanted to put a quick button on the discussion of educator engagement and the work that we're doing through the survey, because this feels like, and it always does, a bit of a perfect moment uh, to be making the, this outreach to individuals who have a great impact on career path decisions of youth. Um, just last night, my wife pointed out to me a, uh, an NPR news piece about a Georgetown University study highlighting um, that there are now less than four-year college educational options that are out-earning at a considerable frequency out-earning certain four-year college degrees. And while earning shouldn't necessarily be the key focus of career engagement discussions because we know there's a lot aviation has to offer that goes beyond um, just pocketbook impacts. I think that as that discussion is permeating with educators who are paying a lot of attention to that kind of analysis, this is an opportunity for industries like ours that can provide uh, long and sustaining career paths to individuals with hands-on or applied or even really great theoretical skill sets or interests, we can take advantage of that. And so that's why engaging these educators who have a great impact on their students and are learning as we all are, that there's a breadth of different options that might not follow traditional college bound paths. It's, it's a great opportunity, a great moment for bodies like this and industries like ours. So in terms of putting this all together into recommendations and ways, of head, ways ahead, what we've been trying to do, and I think those watching this meeting at home will see this throughout our fellow subcommittees, is trying to identify the themes, the key areas in where we believe that action can and should be taken. Um, in some ways, this has been a great exercise in re-energizing uh, beliefs and knowledge that we had coming into this exercise. And in some areas, it's really opened our eyes uh, to what can be done. So in terms of the themes that we've been working on, the first is collaboration. And I think if you've paid attention to career technical education over the past five or more years, you've seen that, that industry engagement and participation in local industry clusters, but also collaboration between industry, government, and academic groups um, really has been uh, central to developments that have been made across different industries. For us in aviation, um, the FAA is currently operating two uh, grant programs, pilot grant programs on the technician and the pilot side that we'd love to be a model to apply to all different, all different parts of the industry. And those are based on collaborative program development between industry, government, 
and academic entities, therefore showing that we can provide a pipeline and sustain career paths with multiple points of entry. It's a really important theme development that we've been building out in terms of developing our, our recommendations. Another one, this, this really has been born out of this great work that's been done by the task force and the subcommittee in terms of getting information about impact on youth and that's educator resources and, and development of tools for educators to teach about the industry. Um, we're learning a lot through the early data we're getting back from our educator survey about things that teachers can and will do in order to uh, expand the breadth of the education they're giving their students. I was just looking through some of the responses yesterday to the early uh, survey data and you can see right off the bat that teachers are incredibly um, resourceful when it comes to what's, a, what's around them in their community. So schools with airports nearby um, have opportunities to get students out there and see aircraft and learn about things that are going on. Um, not every school might be on the outskirts of a major international hub, but if you look around at municipal and county and regional airports, um, I think a lot of educators, if we can get the word out, actually would be quite surprised at the resources that they have in their backyards. And if we package those with toolkits and instructional guides and resources that help them focus curriculum in ways they need to teach core concepts, but also introduce aviation and provide a little bit of excitement to the work that they're doing, which is something we're really learning that educators have a passion for, um, there'll be a lot of value to them and also to us trying to stimulate interest in the industry. And, and the last is engagement, um, uh, which means finding ways to, as we love to say, go, go where they are um, in terms of youth uh, engagement and finding individuals who are gonna grow into industry careers. On a knee-jerk response, this means things like social media and engaging in ways um, that they find interesting and are already participating in outside. But what it really means is learning as an industry and as a, a, a government support groups that there are different ways we can package information, not just focusing on getting our business done for the work that already exists, but in terms of stimulating discussions about becoming participants in this really interesting area of work. And so these three areas have been major for us in trends because they spill out of a lot of what we've learned through the surveys that we've done, stakeholder interviews we've participated in, and what we've learned about impacts that can be made out there in our communities in terms of growing the next generation of aviation professionals. So with that, I'll pass it back to our subcommittee's fearless leader, Yvette. Thanks, Brett. And thanks for everybody for run, running through those so well. Um, so just to cover our next steps and, and to close it out, um, obviously, as Sid mentioned, we could use everyone's help in the distribution of this educator survey. So um, please reach out um, to me or to any of the task force members if you're out there watching this meeting. Um, have a Rolodex of teachers. If there are educators watching, um, please you know, reach out either to the FAA on the public site or to me directly. And obviously then once um, you know, we have some data that we've gathered, there is research and information out there. We'll be working on finalizing our recommendations. And as Brett mentioned, sort of the, the developing themes, at least for our subcommittee, those aren't the only ideas, those aren't the only sort of categories of areas that we feel that this task force may move to once we finalize our recommendations, but we just wanted to highlight those. As he mentioned, our, our subcommittee has really been focused, our um, recommendations around those three themes. Take any questions um, that any of the task force members have for any of our subcommittee members. Terrific report. Um, I'm so excited about the data, right? Because um, I don't think we've seen work like that done specifically with teachers yet. So to get some of that work. And I, just to tell you, I did reach out to Aviation High School and he sent it to his teachers. So you might get some more. I mean, it's a little biased because it's folks that already know aviation, but <laughs> um, you know, they can, they can help. And they've had such great success, especially in the last few years. So, so you talked a little bit about parents in terms of the engagement that's needed. Is there, do you get any sense about where we might be headed in terms of thinking about recommendations around parents? Is there some data gathering that 
that we can be doing, or maybe it's a focus group. We could do more of a, you know, is it makes sense to try to put together something where we specifically think about parents? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll try my best to answer it. Maybe Sid, you can help. Um, I think last public meeting, we talked about um, these career and um, education development sort of um, databases that are required that parents and students and, and teachers need to um, sort of assist in post-secondary uh, education. So that's an area where you can get parent engagement. Um, obviously, once, you know, we outreach to students, if they're minors, we've got to get the parents' um, involvement as well. So mm -hmm. it's, you know, how we can reach out to those groups. I mean, I know other task force members do stuff outside just the school, um, you know, on involving broader reach public sort of um, engagement. So there's opportunities to maybe reach parents there. But Sid, you know, I know they play a big part. I mean, oftentimes I've heard a student might be interested in becoming a pilot, goes home and said, you know, talks to their parents about it. And it's sort of, how do you do that? Or are you sure you really want to, you know, aviation sort of this unknown. Yeah. And it's complicated, right? It's a completely different language. I mean, I've seen parents at open house sort of white knuckling it. Like, I can't believe they chose this. Well, how do I, you know, should I let them, right? Go ahead, Sid. Did you want to add something about parents? Yes, we also had one discussion that is also important that we meet parents where they are. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a discussion on talking about, you know, that could be at church or synagogue, wherever their kids are involved in programs, we need to think outside of the box and make sure that we are um, uh, being able to uh, talk with parents in different arenas. And the school uh, is definitely a support place. Uh, you know, the parents are there and we know that teachers have that relationship uh, with parents. But again, we also want to think outside of the box, uh, wherever kids are in uh, boys and girl clubs or um, any other programs, as well as uh, church synagogues, mm -hmm. uh, synagogues. We want to make sure that we're taking advantage of those uh, resources. So Yvette, can I just ask the subcommittee to, to consider you know, what kind of data we might need around the parent issue, right? So that maybe it's where we, you know, focus our efforts for a one-stop shop, mm -hmm. that there's a, a parent section that particularly looks at the issues that they're asking about, you know, um, do they need, because they, you know, it's such a new field for them, could they use, what are the things that they could use to help them encourage their son or daughter to pursue the field, right? So. If you all could just consider that, you know, what data we might need from parents, that would be incredibly helpful. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, excellent work, everyone. And I, that, that's exactly what I was going to echo, Sharon, is the idea that I, I know that Yvette and I have talked about on the Expanded Pathways uh, subcommittee working together, not just on teachers, but, but also parents. And you know, Brett, it got me thinking about, you know, this, this, this toolkit idea and, and how to, how to really give some data that's really important more for parents than anybody else. That might be a, a really good idea. And then what, what specifically, you know, we could, we could include within that to really help parents make uh, informed decisions. And to Sharon's point, uh, I've seen those parents that are white knuckled and saying, oh my God, what, what are you doing? Uh, why choose this field. Uh, so I, I think we, we definitely could, uh, could see some real value there. My, my second question, Yvette, is as you, were, as you were talking about school outreach kind of at the end here, um, clearly I, I have kids in, in, in school, uh, in, in middle school, grade school, and, and also high school. So I, I just thought, well, why don't I just go over to the school and take this survey and have, have the teachers just take the survey? Uh, so if there's a, a, it sounds like we just ask you and then we, um, what's the best way to kind of get that survey into the hands of, of local schools that, that maybe at least the, many of the task force members who may have kids also could simply just go over to the principal and say, could, could, could you fill this thing out? Is that, is that? Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's a Google I think most educators are familiar with the Google platform and the survey. It's just a Google link. It's a pretty easy survey. And I'll make sure that um, all the task force members have a link um, to that. 
Perfect. Thank, Thank you. And to, to, to build on the first point that Ryan made, I actually, I want to impress on us as a group too, that, you know, this white knuckling concept, um, I think it's a good reminder for us to think about um, how different aviation can be from other areas of work, even for individuals that would already sort themselves for potential interest in aviation careers. I mean, my viewpoint is from the, you know, the technical maintenance technician side, so it may be different from some other facets of the industry. But when you think about the opportunity of going out to work in um, uh, a factory producing parts for uh, automobiles compared to working in a certificated repair station or an OEM producing aircraft parts, I mean, the levels of complexity, oversight, personal responsibility are so um, different but there are a lot of causes to white knuckle um, that bring with them a lot of advantages, the opportunity to do great work, um, be part of a thriving industry, develop a long-term career. I think it's important for those of us who've already uh, drunk our aviation Kool-Aid appropriately to remember how real those differences are. And when we're competing on this very big playing field and we want the best that's gonna come out of that playing field, it's an opportunity for us to understand what is really different and what our people do have to deal with such that we can then translate that for individuals who are sitting you know, in an orientation with you, Sharon, and thinking mm -hmm. either for themselves or for their kids, oh my goodness, what, <laughs> what is going on? Yeah, I mean, there's so many advantages to, to our cultures and, and um, you know, aviation and aerospace, the safety culture, the way that people think, right? It's just, it's foreign to a lot of families. And so being able to provide that sense of excitement and uh, confidence about what we do, I think for families that are completely don't know anything about us, it would be really helpful. Joe, did I see your hand? Yeah. Sorry, on my iPad, I cannot find the raised hand function. Thank you. Um, just a, a comment for a bit. I, I love this work. I love this focus on the parents. Uh, I have found as a, a parent of a, a teen who just soloed last month, um, an excellent, yeah, it's pretty great, uh, white knuckle for sure. Um, <laughs> the driving to the flight, not the flight itself. Um, I have found an excellent resource if you're looking for a focus group, and I've mentioned this, I think, in, in a previous call, the Raising Aviation Teens wow. Facebook group. Mm -hmm. And I'm just continually impressed by a, a grassroots parents group. I think it was one mom who started it, who realized she didn't know anything about aviation and she started finding some other parents in the same place. They have developed some incredible resources that I have gone and used so many times myself as a parent, whether it's scholarship opportunities, I've passed them on to my child, um, accredited universities, advice on ground schools or understanding how AP courses may translate. But I just, I think it's so wonderful that people who, who haven't had our aviation Kool-Aid have gone out and built this platform on Facebook that has thousands of people. And I know a few of us actually are, are on it as well. Uh, Whitney, I know you're, you're one who's on it. Um, it just, it surprises me as someone who's in the industry how helpful it is and how grateful I am that they did that. So perhaps they're a good place to start if they'd be willing, um, because I don't think many of them are from our industry and are trying to encourage their kids uh, in the fields that they've indicated an interest in. That's great um, a recommendation, Joe. Um, I remember we did talk about that. Um, so yeah, that's, and you are not the only one that I've heard um, has benefited from that. I had a, a colleague actually, um, her son is interested in perhaps pursuing and she's like which colleges out there have aviation programs I mean it was like not so easy to find mm -hmm. um Vaughn was first on my <laughs> uh, but um yeah so I had to send her a whole list I had to kind of do her work and create it for her which you know I had no problem doing but it, it took a little bit even for me to do it so yeah I mean I will just tell you a very funny story so my background's in higher ed not aviation necessarily, but I've now been here for 25 years, so I can talk the talk. When I got here, I could not understand why people were talking about the grocery store, A&P, so much. I mean, that that's what I mean. Like, we have these ways of talking about things that people are like, have no sense, right? So, um, 
So Sharon, yeah. we'll, Sharon, we'll get you up on Capitol Hill so you can try to explain what part not which part part ninety one is on the airplane. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm lucky I can I can keep all the parts straight now, right? So, all right, terrific. Any other questions? Oh, yes, go ahead, Ralph. I, Yvette, I, there are a number of uh, teacher organizations that uh, probably would be very productive. Uh, ITEA, ISTE, National Science Teachers Association. The, uh, National Science Teachers Association, when they have their conferences, usually have an aerospace alley just for teachers. And uh, they usually get more than 20,000 people attend their conferences and their membership is significantly larger than that. So if you reach out to the leadership of those uh, teacher organizations uh, that are uh, that have these kinds of memberships, they could be productive if they if you can convince them to send the survey out to their membership. You'd be able to increase your uh, uh, your uh, involvement with the survey. Yeah, thanks, Ralph. I know I I, know, I jotted down. I know in one of our steering committee meetings, um, you had a lot of great resources for teacher uh, sort of large nationwide organization. So I'm checking them off my list and reaching out. Um, but if anyone has contacts there, Ralph, I don't know if you do directly. Um, I've drafted sort of an introductory email um, to make it easier for folks to distribute it. So um, I have had positive response from a few of those. I'm still working some of the others. All of them are listed on the web with their key contacts. Usually the, ex the executive director is listed. Yeah. And that would be the person I would go to initially. Anybody else? Okay, terrific. Thank you very much, Trends Subcommittee. Great report. Thank you, Yvette. Okay, up next, sitting in for Joey Calloran is Whitney Dix. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for allowing me to present today since Joey couldn't be here. Uh, let me share my screen and I will give you a brief overview of um, where we're at and, and what we're doing with the um, Awareness Building Committee. Can you see the screen? Okay. <laughs> so uh, we do have uh, a couple of members on our committee are not here today. Joey Colloran, she's our subcommittee chair. She's unavailable to attend due to another conference. Um, also, we have uh, Stacy Bechtel, who's the president and founder of the Aerospace Education Resource Organization, uh, myself, the manager of dispatch uh, training at Southwest, uh, Captain Jennifer Henderson, she's an engineering test pilot and the chief pilot of the 737 program at Boeing, and Amy Voss, who's the regional training manager at Cirrus. I um, also want to give a good thank you to our FAA subject matters, Christine Sharp and um, Robin Malinga. They have attended all of our um, we meet every other week um, as far as the subcommittee goes to discuss uh, what our next steps are and, and what we're doing. And they have uh, been an excellent resource uh, to us throughout this process. So just real quick, um, our charge to the subcommittee and the questions that we were posed with were to consider how the administration, air carriers, aircraft, power plant, and avionics manufacturers uh, aircraft repair stations and other stakeholders can coordinate efforts to support youth in pursuing careers in aviation. And then we were given um, three questions to consider. Uh, how are FAA employers, others currently involved in workforce development? What would be the best structure for these groups to get together and have best practices to reach youth? Uh, and then are there any existing umbrella groups that could be leveraged to provide a one-stop shop uh, for all of these organizations, students, parents, education, uh, to provide information about um, aviation jobs. So just real quick, uh, what we're doing as far as our awareness building subcommittee, we originally had kind of taken the same path as the trends and had decided to send or create a survey to send out to um, educators or teachers. Uh, and then through some coordination with the trends subcommittee, uh, we found out we were kind of both going in the same direction, so we chose to go another direction. Uh, we've had some meetings, uh, our subcommittee meetings, with a couple of the trends um, committee members, uh, one of them being Sid. So we decided to go uh, in the direction of a survey for guidance counselors uh, at the middle school um, and high school level. 
So over the past few weeks, um, we have developed a series of questions for our survey. We met with Sid. We've met with a couple other people to uh, finalize the questions, narrow them down, and ensure that we're going to get the data back from the questions that we're looking for. Uh, so our survey is, is done. Uh, we're trying to figure out the best medium uh, at how to send it. I'm, I'm assuming it's probably going to go in a Google survey, just like uh, the Trends Subcommittee. And we're trying to find and identify counselors to send it to. So just like the Trends Committee, uh, we would appreciate any feedback on counselors that you uh, have or that your children attend school so that we can get this in the hands of counselors, not only in aviation related programs, but non-aviation related programs. So we're to the point where we're just about ready to send that out. Um, I do believe Joey has worked with uh, several of the uh, larger counselor organizations, or she is trying to get some lists uh, from them uh, to be able to send. Um, also, more recently, uh, we have decided to do some focus groups with some high schools. So uh, small groups, both aviation-related students and non-aviation-related students. Uh, so we're formulating some questions uh, as far as how we want to conduct the focus groups, they will be virtual meetings, probably on a platform such as this, where we are face to face having real conversations with students about about their experiences about aviation. Do they know about jobs in aviation, uh, that sort of thing. So we're hoping to get those arranged in the next couple of weeks and conduct several of those focus groups. And then um, after we get our survey results back. We conduct our focus groups. We'll continue to meet and um, look at the results of the data from the survey, discuss uh, the answers, the focus groups, the, the information that was provided there, uh, and put all of that information together, formulate it, uh, and then apply that to our charge and our three questions uh, and to come up with our recommendations that we want to send from our subcommittee onto the larger task force. So that's really where we're at. We continue to meet um, every other week and um, that's the direction we're moving in. So just kind of a quick update, uh, nothing very lengthy from us, but if you have any questions about what we're doing or definitely if you have resources, whether that be um, guidance counselor resources or um, schools that would be interested in a focus group, please get with either myself or uh, with Joey Colloran um, to let us know and we can definitely put them on our list because. Uh, well, again, like looking for recommendations like the Trends Committee is. Terrific, thank you, Whitney. And um, we're ready to go. Vaughn is gonna give, uh, is gonna use our guidance counselor list, um, which includes okay. you know, non-aviation programs. Joey knows that. So as soon as you're ready to go, we're ready to help. Yeah, uh, Joey definitely has a lot of contacts uh, in high schools being that mm -hmm. deals with the simulator aspect in high schools and stuff. So. So we feel pretty good about some of the focus groups. It's the guidance counselors that we're, we're kind of um, struggling with getting lists. And I know Sid helped us quite a bit, try to provide us some contacts. So um, any of you that have children in the middle school or high school age that uh, we could get a guidance counselor to submit a survey to, please, please let us know. We would really appreciate it. And in terms of your um, focus groups, can you, can you give us a little more detail about that? Or how are you gonna find those students? So Joey is using a lot of her contacts through Redbird uh, to uh, to get with schools, and she knows a lot of these teachers in the aviation community. So we'll, we will garner that uh, from uh, her in the aviation community, but also through her contacts. I believe she's reaching out, and some of those contacts in the aviation world are going to provide us some outside uh, some some teachers that will allow us to discuss discuss with their students or their class that are non aviation related. So. I, I believe that's kind of how we're how we're going. Mm -hmm. um, we just kind of had a discussion on this uh, last week or the week before, so we've just kind of started this process. But uh, that's kind of how we're, we're the process we're kind of leaning towards is relying on the aviation contacts to then help us and provide us some um, some teachers that are non aviation related. Yeah, I mean, I think that the data that you can get from focus groups can be really rich, right? Like the diversity, equity, and inclusion group of students that we talk to. I mean. Yes. Just in conversation, you can get so much really good data. Um, Absolutely. And we yeah. had also looked at, speaking of the parents, we had also talked about that. And since, Joe, I am a part of that group, that Raising Aviation Teens, um, 
I thought that that would definitely be another place to garner some data from. Um, and we just hadn't gotten that far with the focus group and the counselors that we'd already decided. So whether or not the trends can can take that or the awareness building, if we have time, could engage in that. I do think that's a very good idea also. Yeah, terrific. OK, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, Whitney, excellent, uh, excellent, excellent job. Um, and a couple of questions I thought that I would maybe just share. Uh, and and maybe Sid, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have a question for you too, uh, as it applies to counselors. So, so I think what I'll do, Whitney, is I'll give you. Um, we did a really extensive survey um, to high school counselors in the state of Oklahoma, um, and and there might be some some. Um, opportunities there on how they were able to get uh, just it done within the entire state. Uh, it was a very extensive and highly um, um, participated survey, um, and and I think what it what it really showed and is is just the, the tremendous amount of work that that we as aviation have to do um, because here in the state of Oklahoma, aviation was second. Uh, and it's a very, very close second uh, to oil and gas in the entire state of Oklahoma. There are more jobs in aviation in Oklahoma than, than except for oil and gas. And so, but yet none, or, or not none, but I mean, it was a very small portion of the high, high school, middle school, uh, and grade school counselors knew anything about aviation. Uh, yet it was a massive driver of the Oklahoma economy. So um, I think what I'll do is I just, I, I hadn't shared that, but uh, I'm gonna make sure that Whitney, you you get that because I thought it was, there might be some ways for you to kind of see at least from the state of Oklahoma perspective and the work that we're doing, but also just, you know, some best practices. And I thought the other question, um, so that's just a comment, but I think Sid, is there a, a specific ratio uh, that is, that is, you know, public education tries to maintain with regards to student to counselor ratio, and 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 my understanding is that it's it's pretty high. Is is that true? It can be pretty high, and it just depends on the school district. Uh, okay. Every school district can be very different. Uh, again, especially when you have uh, larger cities. Uh, so I don't think um, all school districts have that. A privilege saying, okay, we're going to contain it here, uh, yep. but it, it can be high. And as you all know, um, uh, mental health uh, is a huge issue uh, across the country. Uh, but yes, uh, it's it's no specific ratio. I think most districts, most districts try to do the best that they can uh, as far as hiring a certain number of counselors and trying to make sure that there is uh definitely a counselor in every maybe elementary building, but it doesn't always work that way. It just depends on the, maybe the funding or the uh, resources of that school district. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and under-resourced districts. Yes. Suffer greatly, right? I mean, I know of some places in New York City, you know, it's a thousand students to one guidance counselor. I mean, that's, that's impossible, right? So, you know, I think that's part of what the work that we're doing, right, is how can we make it easy for guidance counselors because they have no real knowledge. So we don't want them to be barrier, right? Uh, we want them to be a resource. So how can we give them the resources to make their job easier when somebody comes in and says, you know, I have these skills, where could I, what can I do with them, right? Or I have this interest, what can I do with it? Exactly. Thanks, Sid. Yeah, go ahead, Brett. Well, first of all, I'm sure guidance counselors have a lot of knowledge. We just want to give them aviation knowledge. So if there are any watching out there in public, don't think it's the position of the task force that guidance counselors have no knowledge. Um, uh, so <laughs> thank you very much. Whitney, I'm curious, looking at um, kind of your subcommittee's charge questions and stepping out of the guidance counselor realm for a minute, I'm curious what you found or have learned or have had your eyes open regarding things the FAA and industry and nonprofits and umbrella groups are currently doing already uh, to stimulate workforce development. And the reason why I'm asking is, you know, I think anecdotally, all of us have seen in the past several years that there's a lot of great stuff that goes on. Um, and one of the great challenges is connecting all that great stuff together. 
And as a task force, you know, we've already got kind of collective ideas on addressing that, but I'm curious what you found. Well, you know, we've found similarly to what everybody already knows, there's a lot of work being done by various organizations and businesses and uh, the FAA as far as whether or not it's attending an air show or it's a camp or um, somebody going into schools and speaking. There's a lot of development being done, but just like you said, there is no cohesive network for it. And unless you know where it is, or you happen to see an ad for it, or you follow a social media site that talks about it, then you're not going to know about it. And so again, uh, one of the emerging um, ideas that keeps coming up is how do we put that together? And, and how, do you, how do you place all of the wonderful development aspects of the industry as a whole all together in one spot, you know, and I think that um, we'll see in, in probably a, many of the recommendations from the subcommittee groups is how to create that one-stop shop and, and what umbrella group uh, has the ability or can do it, or is it a whole nother group that needs to be created? Uh, so putting all that information together is definitely um, a key to awareness and a big trend that we are all seeing is how do we make that cohesive? Yeah, go ahead, Tamara. Good, good morning. I just wanted to ask, um, ask you guys with regard to the last point that Brett just made. I, we have been very successful in being a, um, a, an organization that connects the dots. Um, while we do have a tremendous amount of success as a nonprofit, uh, Aerostar has uh, garnered uh, a way to collaborate uh, with organizations, not just in our region, but across the country. I was wondering if you guys, um, as a part of the funding committee, which, which we'll be presenting a little bit later, have you guys identified specific needs uh, with regard to what would need to be funded? Um, so if you say fund a one-stop shop, like what, what does that look like? Or uh, what would what would be the costs kind of uh, associated with being able to solve some of the, the collaborative problems? So my, an example would be getting information out to counselors. What type of campaign would that, would that look like uh, for counselors to get information? I mean, it's good for all of us to share with counselors that we know personally, but, uh, but to be able to establish a way that we can um, we can get information into people's hands in masses. Uh, one of the things that I thought about, and it hasn't been talked about much, is arts and entertainment. Uh, I think anybody on this call that 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 went through the first uh, wave of aviation and space um, uh, adventure in America know that the media played a large role in establishing the trends. Um, and I see a lot of you guys shaking your head yes, from Star Trek to, um, to Star Wars, uh, commercials, McDonald's, like major brands were actually doing a lot of the messaging behind, behind America's push towards uh, the space race. And have you guys um, thought about that also as a way to create messaging uh, and marketing and branding using um, celebrity. And I know a lot of celebrities have pilot's licenses now. Um, and this might be a way that we can leverage what we need to get done uh, in a major way by getting brand ambassadors, not just social influencers on social media, but uh, just wanted to put that out there if you guys thought of, of ways uh, that we can we can go big and, um, and and do it in a way that's impactful and grabs young people uh, where they already are. And that's, uh, that's media. Any ideas, Whitney? You know, that's not even something I've really even thought about. I've been so locked into the social media aspect because that's mm -hmm to be where youth and children are living nowadays, but you're right, getting in front of the television or just an ad where, you know, I mean, you could see um, there's a lot of stuff, interesting things being done now in the space world via social media, um, but, you know, put one of those girls that's looking to go to Mars in, in a commercial and, 
and the world does open up. I know that um, not too long ago, uh, I think Oil of LA had done a campaign with a female pilot. Um, and so there is definitely some interesting aspects there that we should all think about. Um, but I know absolutely nothing about that world. Uh, but it definitely would be a, a very good um, awareness building campaign for just the industry, the aerospace community as a whole, for sure. Yeah, I I I will take part of this one on because, um, you know, the Ad Council, so the free public service announcement. That's right. They've done one for girls in STEM. And I wonder if we could do one, if we could convince them to do, and they're free, right? It's, you know, it's a government funded entity. Um, I'll see what it takes. You know, they probably get thousands of proposals, but, um, you know, maybe because of the weight of the task force, we might be able to make a pitch to say- I've been, hey, I've been thinking about this for a while, especially in, in the African-American community, uh, when it came out that one of the rappers got their pilot's license, Ludacris got his pilot's license, um, uh, um, was, um, Okay, Morgan Freeman has his pilot's license. Mm -hmm. And now I don't know if you guys saw on the news last week, but William Shatner will be going to space on Bezos rocket. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is this is something that um, we we probably want to get ahead of to use an out uh, to our advantage uh, to to specifically engage youth and use media and celebrity uh, in campaigns to be able to uh, to leverage that in a really big way. So Sharon, anything yeah. that I can do to help you prepare something for the Ad Council, I'm, yeah. I'm all for it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, we could use a schoolhouse rock of aviation, right? <laughs> Not that anybody watches cartoons on Saturday morning anymore, but <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Sid. As Whitney, uh, as uh, in regards to awareness, uh, and thank you, Ryan, uh, for the question uh, regarding counselors. Um, I just wanted to say that uh, the collaboration is definitely important. And one way that uh, I found as a previous high school counselor was when uh, universities actually came, uh, uh, college reps would come to the school. Uh, so while we are busy, there are different ways that we can definitely collaborate with, with uh, universities and others so that that uh, aviation uh, information is getting to our to students. Uh, or while I, for eight years as a high school counselor, uh, I do recall uh, the Air Force uh, coming out to take part um, uh, as a college rep, but I don't recall any other uh, colleges with an aviation major or aviation uh, focus uh, ever uh, calling and contacting us to, um, you know, just come out and share with students. So that is a way to collaborate um, mm -hmm. along with uh, something that uh, the Trends Committee has uh, floated around is a consortium. Uh, as a high school counselor, I would often attend um, uh, college consortiums, and it was a way for uh, colleges to really show off and highlight uh, the different uh, uh, majors that offered, uh, whether that was uh, aviation or in, in anything. So I think it's something we need to continue to take advantage of when it comes to awareness. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. So it's a little easier for us because we are mostly aviation, right? That's mostly what we do. So when we go to a college fair, that's what people see. But if a more uh, a liberal arts or a larger institution that offers lots of programs, that admissions counselor is there repping psychology, business, AV, right? So it becomes harder for them to, to help educate about what the career fields are. So you're right about, you know, there needing to be this real collaboration, especially with, because um, I think there's, there's roughly 40, you know, aviation institutions across the country that probably have great impact in their immediate regions, right? But beyond that, much harder. Um, so that's where this toolkit could be really helpful to make it super easy for guidance counselors to just go find that resource when they need it, if they're not served by an ed educational institution in their region. So yeah, Amy. Um, going back to what Tamara said about um, television and things like that. There have been a few Netflix and um, like Amazon Prime things recently featuring like the Elon Musk. Um, I just had to Google it, but it's called The Countdown. Countdown. Yeah. yeah. 
That was a great show. Um, I think we have, as an awareness, we have kind of overlooked those things. On like I and I do think that it's really good that you brought that up because um, it's important to kind of meet people in all of these different spaces. Um, I would say that the only challenge with focusing on that type of media is it's really difficult to track or, or more difficult to track. If that's where somebody um, met their inspiration, it's really challenging to say like to pinpoint that. Um, and so maybe that's why we haven't focused on it. But if we could circle back and try to think of ways to, to meet people um, on Amazon Prime or Peacock or Netflix or whatever it is that they're watching or through like ad, ad campaigns during different types of events, like that would be, um, yeah, that's definitely a great way to to reach people. Yeah, I think it's, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's, it, this is a multi-layered approach and not everything is going to lead, right? But it's seeing it over and over and over and over and over again. That's how we're going to have impact, right? So this is just another way to reach them. Yep. And I think, I think, Amy, I think to your point to not um, put our, all, all of our eggs in a basket of media, but even if we can't track them, you know, if one celebrity goes up in the airplane ride for a flight lesson, like Kim Kardashian, oh my, the, the, the next week flight, flight schools are going to be full. I mean, right. I'm, and that's, so do, do in, in that case, do we really care if we can track them? The, no. the, the, exactly. So the numbers are going, the, we, sometimes it doesn't matter if the cart's for, for first or the horse first. If you need the stuff that's in the cart, then just grab what's in the cart. I yeah. don't know if we, if, if we get to the level of that amount of exposure to the masses, the tracking is going to come through other ways like the pathways committee, like the trends committee, because we can see direct effects mm -hmm. of something like that, implementing and initiating and being a catalyst for a trend. And yeah. this happened in the sixties and you guys know, but you probably studied or were part of seeing the space race when space was everywhere, all on TV and the TV shows. Um, and then we didn't have to track how people got interested in space. Mae Jemison became a, an astronaut because she saw a Lieutenant Uhuru. <laughs> that is her story. And I don't know how many people know that, but that is exactly why Mae Jemison decided to become, become an astronaut. So it's, it's really important uh, that, like you said, Sharon, to, to kind of the multi-layered approach. And we don't have to figure out everything, but what we do know is when we get messages out to the masses, uh, there will absolutely be some, some, um, some conversions. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we might be able to extrapolate that if we get enough media, but I think at, at a certain point, if it's, if it's diverse enough and through different media outlets, we definitely will see impact. Well, and shows like The Countdown feature so many different aspects of aviation that it's it's nice because it can inspire somebody in, in the engineering or inspire in, in somebody to go into aviation as a pilot or astronaut. So I think that when you have something that broad, um, you have an opportunity to inspire people in a variety of different ways that maybe a targeted um, like social media post wouldn't hit. So and you know, Amy, the most incredible thing about what that show uh, depicted was that they were for regular people who became astronauts. They weren't PhDs and physicists. And these were people that like won a contest and got trained to be an astronaut in six months. Like this, this, when we say it's not rocket science, we have to get average people to believe that aviation and space is for everyone. And I think stuff like the more we put that message out there, the more we're going to be able to draw people to the industry at large to, to fill all of the jobs, not, not just being the astronaut, but, but designing the, the suits and getting astronauts stressed and, you know, checking the air quality or we're teaching them how to do experiments in space. Like it's so much that, that we can do. And those were regular people that were at work one day and got a call and say, you go into space. Yeah, so one of our greatest advantages is that you can do any job in aviation that you can think of, but it's also one of our disadvantages because it makes it harder to describe what we do, <laughs> right? Um, so we're running a little behind schedule as usual. We're having awesome conversation. That's fine. If, um, oh, wait, who just gave up the hand? Oh, Casey, go ahead. It's okay. <laughs> 
real quick, I was just going to yeah. mention what Tamara said triggered my memory that in our earlier conversations um, for our first survey with industry stakeholders, that actually came up from um, a couple of different women that, you know, we don't have that representation in movies anymore. And they had some great ideas about Netflix reality shows, like you have these cooking shows. And like Amy said, it just seemed kind of, it's so high, it's so big that we kind of swept it under the rug. But I love that you brought this back up because I mean, if you ask me personally, I I did, I went into what I did because of two movies, Space Camp and Top Gun. It, it's the truth, you know, and I know I'm not alone. So it is, it is very powerful. And Russia just sent up an astronaut, uh, an actress and a director two days ago to the International Space Station to do a movie. Tom Cruise is supposedly going up later this year. So things are starting to get in the works, but if if we can, you know piggyback onto that and see what else we can do. And that's along the lines of meet these kids where they are. They love the movies. They, they love reality TV shows. So anyway, I just, I love that. And it triggered my memory that we've had these conversations and I think we'd have a lot of support for that. Perfect. Thank you, Casey. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. I think it's important to look at some existing uh, resources that are out there in terms of media. NASA has NASA TV, which is uh, available and uh, relatively easy to access. And it's targeted mostly at teachers and others, uh, but they put out a lot of good production material. And if there are other ideas that they could use, I'm sure they'd be interested because they do a lot of aviation and space. In addition to that, uh, uh, a number of years ago, NASA did a very extensive database on uh, Century of Flight. And uh, Debbie Galloway did that uh, initiative when she was at NASA. It's a huge amount of resources going back all the way to 1903. Uh, and it stopped, of course, when the uh, in 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 two thousand three. But uh, it was uh, it's an amazing resource, and we should look at some of these existing uh, materials that are available and avenues for getting the information out. Terrific. Okay. Thank you very much, Whitney. Didn't mean to give you a lot more work, but <laughs> that's okay. Uh, thanks for all the ideas. You know, just a real shameless plug real quick. We need another show like Airline back in the day that highlighted Southwest Airlines and, and the everyday operation. But you can take that reality type environment and place it in many different aspects of the aerospace community. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Oh, Nancy. Sorry, just one little thing, you know, <clears throat> I'm listening to everybody talk about all these great ideas. The only thing I think in my mind is, yeah, I have two nieces, 14 and, and almost 18, and I'm thinking to myself, do they even watch TV? I know they are, um, you know, very much YouTube, TikTok, all of that. And so as we think about these great show opportunities, you know, is it is it maybe a direction we want to look at, a, you know, different avenue for that? Is there a YouTube channel that should be devoted to this with the programming and the videos and all of that? Um, because the only way that they go on Netflix, I think, is when my sister says, oh, there's a show you have to watch or this thing, and they sort of reluctantly sit and do it. So um, just want to put that as, as a framework out there in terms of delivery method. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there's also ways that you can if you show a particular interest, right, it will pop up. There's algorithms that will give you things, right? So making sure that that aviation things come into somebody's feed when they look at, I don't know, you name it, right? So, um, yeah. Read on that one, definitely. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, terrific. Okay, thank you. Okay. And we will have time later on. We actually set aside a whole hour, almost a whole hour. Um, to talk, uh, you know, big, broad themes and ideas. Um, so they'll, if, if you have another question, just save it. We can get to it in a bit. Okay, funding. Ralph. I'm gonna share my screen. And uh, let me see where it is. So stop your share. I got it. There you go. Okay, so this is the funding subcommittee and uh, we're gonna uh, give you a bit of an overview of what we've been doing. So our committee members are the following. I'm the chair of the subcommittee. I'm the founder and executive director of the Real World Design Challenge and president of RKC International. We've also got Tamara Holmes, who's the founder and CEO of Aerostar Consulting Corporation 
and Aerostar Avion Institute. Uh, John Huff is uh, Vice President of Human Resources at HACO Americas. Uh, David Purser, who's not able to be here today, uh, is, with, is an aviation physics instructor at Carn City High School. And we have, of course, our, our two aviation, AVSED uh, uh, team members who've been uh, great in uh, providing a lot of insight and help, uh, Joni Christian and Michelle Christensen. Uh, we've had, uh, I'd like to go over the funding subcommittee process. We've, uh, we've done extens an extensive review and analysis of the literature, looking at a lot of the thing, the research and other things that have been done uh, uh, as extant material. We've also looked at 40 years of government and private workforce reports, going back to the Reagan administration with a nation at risk and all of the other ones that followed. This problem of the, uh, the workforce has been around for a long time and people have been looking at it for quite a while. And we've looked at the ideas and, uh, and approaches and recommendations that people have offered over that 40 year period. We've also done research and analysis of existing funding sources, such as government, corporations, foundations, trusts, individuals, and fees even. Uh, the, uh, the government sources that we've looked at have been organizations like the National Science Foundation, US Department of Education, and uh, NASA and others. We're also developing ideas to address the workforce issue using uh, funding strategies based on the research that we've done. Uh, and we're uh, in the process of getting feedback from key stakeholder groups using stru structured interviews. We decided on structured interviews rather than, a, than a, a questionnaire because structured interviews allow us to do two things. One, it provides uh, comparable data based on specific questions. And then it allows us to have the flexibility to interact with the key stakeholders and probe more uh, than a questionnaire would allow for. So it's a really good uh, tool that we've been using. Uh, we've identified four stakeho key stakeholder groups. The first is uh, commercial aviation. Then we have aerospace and defense, uh, legislative and education. And we've been inviting these, uh, uh, we have about 50 people on our list representing those diverse uh, stakeholder groups to our uh, uh, subcommittee meetings and conducting these interviews. Each interview uh, lasts about an hour uh, and we usually have uh, approximately two people per session. And so we've been going through these interviews, we're getting a lot of really good information. Uh, the people are really excited to participate and uh, we've had a lot of success uh, in getting their involvement. And now I'd like to ask uh, Tamara to take over here. Thanks, Ralph. Um, so through all the research that we have done over the past several months, we realized that there are some really big and um, impactful gaps in traditional funding sources. The first one we looked at was loans. Uh, of course, loans, a loan is a loan, right? It has to be repaid. It, it, uh, interest is always accruing um, and qualification requirements present barriers to access. Um, so a lot of times when young people are looking to go to get loans to fund um, their aviation specific training, uh, they have to qualify for those loans. And when you look at uh, our push to get a more diverse and a more inclusive aviation industry, we know that those qualification requirements can sometimes be a barrier uh, to access that funding uh, just based on their parents' uh, income or financial status. Um, and they're probably at an age where they really don't even have um, credit or a financial track record of their own to be able to secure funding. Uh, and it has a dis we've found that there's a disproportionate uh, negative outcomes among underrepresented borrowers, specifically the amount of interest that's accrued over time, the long the, the time that it takes uh, on average to repay those loans and the number of loans uh, of underrepresented borrowers that actually go into default due to uh, the lack of um, employment opportunities. Uh, so we really need to look at um, the gaps in loans. And uh, that's one of the recommendations that we um, uh, will put forth to, uh, to the commission that you can advance the slide. Scholarships. Uh, everybody loves scholarships. Uh, students all over the country uh, go into scholarship season and apply for many scholarships. 
but they are difficult to locate it when it comes specifically to aviation. Uh, even if you uh, are affiliated with or know about organizations that give aviation scholarships, a lot of times you have to be a dues paying member. Uh, you have to be uh, active or you have to um, you have to actually know where to source those um, scholarships because they're not located in any centralized list. So one of the things that uh, has made this very difficult for young people, again, that was, as we've discussed earlier in this conversation, is information, finding the information about the scholarships and being able to um, apply. They don't often fund vocational education programs. Uh, so a lot of uh, educate vocational education programs, which are now referred to at the uh, secondary level as CTE, career and technical education, are funded through the high school. But what we have found is that once kids graduate from high school, uh, a lot of funding does not help them continue uh, their education to actually complete the licensure or certification. And we've seen this in several different cases where aviation um, programs exist at the high school levels and the students don't necessarily complete the licensure before high school graduation, but they could be so close and still not be able to have or find the funding to complete the licensure uh, within months after high school graduation. Uh, and the reason why I'm speaking specifically about high schools is because this is the youth access to American jobs in aviation. So we're really focusing on the um, the issues that have gaps in funding concerning our young people. Uh, they usually offer one-time support. And as you know, most youth, uh, that first scholarship could be their entry or their opportunity to get into a flight camp, to get into um, a, a training program, to get some flight hours. But we all know that this is a long game when it comes to aviation. And one-time support for um, experiential learning opportunities or portions or segmented training can be devastated for young people, for example, learning to become a pilot. Flying off and on is not good. Waiting for money to be able to put in the, it on your books so that you can fly at school is not good. Um, you have to be able to maintain um, time in the aircraft once you stop flying uh, to keep those technical skills sharp. And one-time support opportunities do not allow for that consistency of growth uh, and, and uh, training when it comes to uh, aviation careers. Um, Scholarships are heavily dependent on philanthropic giving. And as we have experienced uh, the ebbs and flows over the last two years uh, with the COVID pandemic and um, unemployment and uh, philanthropic giving, it's gone up and down and fluctuated all over the place. Well, when young people are dependent on uh, and organizations that do the type of work that needs to be done uh, that this task force is recommending, uh, we need a solid footing for uh, scholarships and uh, funding opportunities for the work to get done on a consistent basis. And philanthropic giving is great, but it's not consistent. And, and it's not long term. A lot of major funders do not want to source your organization over a long time or your training. They want you to be able to diversify how you're going to pay for your funding. And, um, and scholarships, again, are a short term solution to a long term problem. Grants are amazing. Um, if any, any organization that's on here that has been fortunate enough to win a grant, small or large, know that it is a win. You know, just the, just the, the application process in itself uh, can be uh, so tedious. And then when you get to um, being able to um, apply for multiple grants, you know, at the same time, uh, it can really be taxing. What we found is very few grants actually focus on aviation specifically. Uh, for it to be one of the largest uh, economic uh, pools of revenue generation for the United States of America, uh, for, for us not to have funding sources that can be granted to organizations, small, medium, and large, is an issue that we really need to focus on. The FAA has done a great job recently with releasing um, two uh, federal grants uh, for pilots and technicians, but we absolutely need to see more of that in order to not only sustain the growth of the future of the aviation industry, but to create um, impact for the talent pipeline development that we so desire to see. And you'll hear more of that from the Pathways uh, Committee. Uh, a low success rate. 
the success rate of winning grants is very low. Um, most grants now are invitation only. So that means you have to already be in this good old boys or girls club uh, to be able to have access to even the application. Um, and then winning those grants, uh, we found that they're so competitive that um, you're really throwing the future of the aviation industry, if we're depending on grant, to chance. Um, and there are a lot of organizations doing incredible amount of work on a small scale that really need funding just to get to the next level, which is what we all hope uh, that awareness and trends would do for our organizations, right? Um, and then the robust tracking and evaluation sometimes creates a bottleneck in the actual work that needs to be done. And I know that investors in, in grants um, and in um, the philanthropic space that are giving grants want to ensure their return on investment when they're giving money, they wanna do their due diligence and making sure that the money that they're giving to organizations is gonna be utilized um, and, uh, and individuals are gonna be a good steward over what they, uh, what they win. But some of the tracking mechanisms that have been um, place as a requirement on the grants really are counterproductive to the work of the mission of the organization itself. And this is something that we really want to uh, look at as we consider um, addressing the gaps in funding sources with regard to loans, scholarships, and grant funding. John? So, I won't read these points, but I think that um, it's clear that we've got to have a holistic industry view of, of funding sources as we look at the problems of, of um, trying to make sure that, that people can get into this industry and take advantage of the opportunities. So I think that's obvious, but um, to Tamara's point, it has to be a sustainable mechanism. There's got to be a way for there to be um, not just a one-time grant or one-time scholarship or one-time funding source. It needs to be, um, I think through the discussions our group has had, we feel the ideas that are out there need to be sustainable. So that's very important as well. And of course, one of the themes that's continued within our group as we've talked is we need to make sure that there's a way for us to link the efforts to being able to track how many people we have that are interested in going into aerospace or interested in aerospace at all, but also how many are actually going into the workforce. So those two items, I think, are, are critical to all of the actions that we take. And while there's not a lot of detail on the slide, one of the things that struck me when I'm listening to all of the ideas that are coming out, our group has really focused on more traditional ideas. We, I think we've had some creative ideas but I think that to some extent, we're going to have to take a look at all of these ideas, um, even towards the end of, of this um, team's efforts to try to match those types of funding um, ideas to those new ideas that are coming out. For example, um, you know, looking at a, a, a streaming YouTube type channel, we haven't really looked at that as a way of how does that get funded. But I think that all of the ideas we have still can apply to um, much of the creative um, approach that I think that, that everybody is coming up with. So with the funding group, I think one of the challenges has been um, making sure that the ideas match the ideas of the other groups. So it's nice to be able to see that we're getting to the point where those um, other ideas can be vetted to consider how could our group help make recommendations in the future um, or ideas that would be helpful for that. So um, with that, I think that that wraps up our, our portion and um, we certainly would be willing to address any questions that might be there. Yeah, terrific. Thank you very much to the committee. So just um, a quick question and then just a little bit of a, an update that the group may not be aware of. So the current infrastructure bill um, there's been a significant push by the Biden administration to provide free community college, right? So two free years of community college. But the piece that people may not know about is there's also um, a significant part of that bill that allows for two free years at minority serving institutions. So places like Vaughan, Hampton, Elizabeth City, places that have aviation programs, right? So 
you know, one of the suggestions we might make is that, you know, there'd be these really strong connections between aviation programs and community colleges across the country, and that those could be great pathways for students to take. Now, that doesn't provide for tra flight training, right? It would provide for lots of other careers in aviation, but it doesn't necessarily provide for flight training. So that's a separate piece. But if that bill passes, and who knows, <laughs> but there is some provision in there to help uh, help students that could get a four-year bachelor's degree in lots of different aspects of aviation with no debt, which would be incredible. So just that one piece of information. I guess, um, you know, we're going to, in the end, we're going to make these recommendations to the FAA. And we know that government agencies, lots of government agencies get mandates, but don't get the funding, right? So do we have a sense, Ralph, in your group of is, is, um, is workforce development funded at a high enough level in the FAA? And should we be making a recommendation about, you know, how we how we make sure that that effort lives on, um, particularly, you know, over the next 20 years when we're going through this crisis? Well, I think that the answer to the question is no. Uh, the, uh, you know, I'm familiar with the, the two grants that everybody's been uh, waving the flag about, they're about $5 million each. Uh, those are wonderful uh, efforts, but 5 million is not gonna solve, or 10 million total is not gonna solve the workforce issue. It's a drop in the bucket. Uh, I think that, uh, that there also needs to be strong support in terms of commitment and funding for ABSET. I think ABSET is a, a major uh, tool that the FAA has to enhance the workforce. So these are the kinds of things that I think could be uh, could be done. Uh, I certainly the FAA has done, had uh, major steps in the right direction, but uh, in terms of the answer, I don't think funding is is where it should be. Yeah, Tamara. I I agree with Ralph. Uh, Ralph, we we've actually been looking at um, this for for a while, and I think. I think your first comment lends itself directly to your sec to your question. Um, Joel, Ryan, and, and myself on this call, um, we literally have created in Chicago exactly what the new infrastructure bill is proposing. Um, we talked to Joel, right? And I talked to Joel in what, January of 2020 for, and to, for AIM to come to Chicago. Uh, Ryan and I worked for almost a year and a half to talk to the community college, Olive Harvey, mm -hmm. to launch um, an aviation maintenance program. Ryan and I designed the course curriculum for them, laid out how the college credits could be could be uh, implemented. And Joel did it. Um, Joel did his magic and, and bought a huge building on 37th and Ashland. And the ribbon cutting was two weeks ago. We now have a pipeline from Aerostar's K through 12 programs to juniors and seniors going to Olive Harvey College for free to start aircraft maintenance general. They go from Olive Harvey into Joel's new AIM facility down the street on 37th and, and Ashland. And then SIU is in the process of articulating the four year bachelor's online maintenance management degree. There is a way to do all of this. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, if we look at workforce development as the pipeline, we have to create recommendations, which is what I think Ralph has led us so, um, so incredibly into doing, is looking at ways to fund the whole pipeline. Mm -hmm. Because if Aerostar wasn't funded, honestly, there wouldn't even be a feeder in Chicago for AIM. It just wouldn't be. We've seen these aviation programs come and they say if we build it, they will come. And then a lot of times they don't come. And then aviation programs were closing like crazy in the last five to 10 years because there was no pipeline. So, and it, and it wouldn't have been possible without Ryan and AAR coming in saying, you know what, we'll provide support at the high school level to make sure they get the pre-training to go directly into AIM. And then Olive Harvey going out and getting grants and being funded. So, your two points are, are one and the same, and I know you probably didn't think they were when you said them, but the infrastructure bill, if that is funding that is going to allow for a portion of the pipeline to be funded, 
then we are on our way to funding workforce development as a whole. And I think that's an excellent, excellent way to uh, to split the pie, right? Because everybody can't pay for everything. And um, where we can get funding for different parts of what we're doing uh, and with the public-private partnerships, which I think we, we that's, that's what some of our recommendations absolutely entail, is being able to have everyone play a role in the nonprofit, the for-profit, the, edu the, the education institutions. Um, and, uh, and, and we have, we've done it, you know, in an extraordinary way here in Chicago. And it took us, I started working on it probably nine years ago, but, you know, it wasn't until Joel and Ryan came to the table uh, with the help of the city of Chicago that, that got us over the hump. And that's, that's the collaboration that uh, the awareness and the trends committee was talking about. That's great. Thank you, Tamara. Great example. Yeah, go ahead, Ralph. Um, what Tamara said and what I have, uh, have said, are, I think are all true. I think we need uh, a significant amount of funding to fund the whole pipeline. I think that's clear. It needs to be ongoing funding so that these programs don't have the gaps and, and hiccups that in some cases cause them to go away. Uh, but in addition to that, I think we also need to look at uh, existing capabilities that we have that can come together that don't cost additional money. So for example, um, uh, with our program, Real World Design Challenge, we're in the process of doing a partnership with Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University to develop a nationwide course for high school teachers in aviation. And uh, that will be offered free for teachers across the country. And we're in the process of doing that development. So some, and th those things are not necessarily things that we that require a huge amount of additional funding. So I think we need to look at all of the different ways that we can attack this problem. Certainly funding is needed. I don't want to quibble about that. But I think there are other things we can do in addition that can help uh, move the ball forward. Perfect. Yeah, Joel. Completely agree um, uh, with, uh, uh, with what was just said. And of course, Tamara um, uh, has a way of taking uh, information and making it immediately inspiring. So thank you very much for that, Tamara. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I agree that uh, funding is always is always an issue. Um, I've never heard anybody in any sector ever say, "I need less money." Uh, you know that that that's not something we say. Um, but I will say, um, uh, I, I think that very much of what we want to accomplish um, uh, happens in creativity of, of different groups. Um, so Sharon, you, you talk about Vaughn and Vaughn and AIM have something in common in that we're private organizations and not likely to be on um, uh, Biden's checklist of, uh, uh, or, or you know, you know first, first statement of solutions and yet what we, you know, what we at AIM have had to do is say, yeah, yeah, we, we actually have the ability to be a solution. And so whether it's the project in Chicago where um, uh, we're offering our program at the community college's rate um, and, and ultimately subsidizing aviation education for the city and, and state um, or any one of our um, uh, programs, we have six programs around the country where we, we actually sponsor the high school programming where students do the general portion of part 147 in high school at no charge to the high school, no charge to the student. Um, it, it takes these kinds of, um, I guess, bold um, uh, initiatives of, of giving and benevolence to then say, all right, so how can we make it sustainable? Because it, it's, it's actually not sustainable if everything's for, for free or everything's discounted. How do we I, I, Sharon, I think you're right. How do we communicate to the Biden administration? Hey, your heart's in the right place with uh, community college, but community colleges only have about a quarter of the A and P students. Uh, and just talking about maintenance here, um, how do we how do we allow uh, the resources to really be a full a full on solution for aviation? And I'd love to be able to communicate that in, in some way. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Yeah, Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, obviously this committee has is, is got the, uh, you know, funding is, is always the challenge, but I, I appreciate the work and the effort, you know, Ralph, you and the committee have done. You know, one of the things I, I would just, you know, as I've been looking at some of the grant programs that are out there and starting to look at possibly, you know, 
partnering with agents with, you know, with an organization that this is what they do. They grant right for organizations, you know, is there a way and, and could your group look at, is there a way for, you know, interdepartmental communication surrounding grants that might apply in, in the, in workforce, in aviation that are coming through either the EDA the Department of Labor, Energy, and all the various departments within the government. So is there a way to somehow coalesce grants? Because to your point, money is important and, and that kind of thing, but maybe there is money available that we just don't know is available. And I'm, I'm wondering as we kind of continue to down this kind of one-stop shop kind of idea, you know, a big part of that is where are those funding opportunities, you know, through the various government agencies and NSF and NASA and all that stuff that we as industry and, and, and nonprofits and so on and so forth just may not know and have the resources to know, you know, where they are. So just, just a comment that I'd, I'd love for, you know, maybe an update next time around on is, is, that, a, is that a possibility or not? Well, let me just make a, a comment about that. Uh, there are some existing agreements that are in place. So for example, uh, I happened to attend the, uh, the session where the secretaries of labor, education uh, and, uh, and transportation got together and signed an MOU for those three agencies to collaborate on, uh, on basically on education. So uh, those kinds of things are possible. Uh, the uh, U.S. Department of Education uh, was a lead organization in the federal government for a long time. Uh, when I worked at the White House, they were the ones that did the collaboration among the federal agencies uh, and coordination of the agency's uh, initiatives. Uh, that uh, that uh, 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 interagency collaboration group has been disbanded. However, the, uh, the Office of Science Technology Policy that reports directly to the White House is in existence and they would be a, an excellent group to uh, help with that kind of collaboration. Yeah, that's an interesting point. I mean, HUD grants for Hispanic serving institutions, right? You wouldn't necessarily know to go look for those if you were in offering aviation programs, right? But as a U.S. Department of Education designated Hispanic serving institution, I can do things with the community around, you know, housing and urban development grants that tie together a lot of different people. And you wouldn't necessarily go looking at HUD <laughs> for that kind of information. Yeah, that's, that's a great correct. Plan. Yeah. Um, OK, any other questions for funding? I don't know about you, but I need a bio break. <laughs> we were scheduled to take one from 1030 to 1040. So we'll use um, uh, the last group, uh, Ryan's Expanded Pathways group, to, uh, as part of our um, discussion, broader discussion we were going to have. Um, any other questions for funding? OK, so why don't we come back at 1050? OK. Okay, welcome back everybody. It's very happy in the break to see some headlines about December expected to be the busiest travel month in two years. That's some very hopeful signs about the future. Um, okay, throwing it over to Ryan for Expanded Pathways. Thanks so much, Sharon, and uh, thanks everyone for for being here today. And uh, just wanted to uh, kind of start out by just giving a, a little shout out to, to the team here uh, on the Expanded Pathways Committee. I mean, it couldn't, I know everybody's doing a lot of work. And uh, I, as I thought about it over the break, I, I also wanted to, you know, give a, you know, special thanks to all the the organizations that have supported this, right? I mean, all of all of us typically work for somebody, and uh, for for our ability to be able to to take the time and invest in the the resources that it takes to work the subcommittee and the meetings that go on, I, I truly truly appreciate that. And 
with that said, I, I just want to give a little bit to to my subcommittee, uh, you know, Joanne uh, or Joe D'Amato from the uh, Business uh, National Business Aviation Association, uh, Dr. Nancy Hawking from uh, JetBlue Airlines, James Hall from Wichita State University, Dr. Joel English from Centura College and the Aviation Institute of Maintenance. Of course, uh, I'm I'm Ryan Gertz and I'm from AAR. Um, and then, of course, we've had a lot of conversations and this kind of theme about the FAA and the resources that they've been able to provide, just the tremendous resources they've been able to provide to, to each of our, our, to this task force, as well as the subcommittees themselves. Uh, Ed, who has, has been just tremendous uh, for, for us uh, in some of our individual meetings that we've had and the amount of, of resources that he's been able to provide, you know, from not just his geographical area in the Northeast, but, but how he, he is engaged with the entire uh, AVSED team across the, across the, the nation uh, is, is, is truly a, a testament, I think, to the, um, you know, this conversation. And I think, um, um, Ralph had brought this up, and I'll get to it a little bit. My presentation is is what the FAA has really done, uh, you know, since 2008 reauthorization, um, and I want to spend a little bit of time kind of reflecting upon that and and just making sure that I think um, as we as a committee continue to move forward um, in in each of our subcommittees, just making sure that we're thinking about um, just the tremendous work the FAA has has done up to this point and is. Is 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 slated to do, uh, you know, in the future. So, um, the charge uh, of of our our subcommittee is is to really look at uh, expanding the various pathways that are out there. There's there's many. Uh, there's also the the fact that because there's many, there's it's it's also challenging. Uh, it's challenging, uh, especially I, I I feel when you get beyond the, the pilot pathway. It, it seems. It's a simpler process uh, to kind of understand that you'll go to school and you'll be a flight instructor, you'll be a regional airline pilot, you'll be maybe an airline, you know, senior airline captain, or you'll go a, a corporate route. But I think when you get into aviation maintenance uh, in particular, it gets a lot more convoluted uh, in all of the different career paths uh, that are out there. So we've really been focused on that as, as our committee is to, to really take this specific charge and really you know, drive home. What do we think? Um, it's 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 not about reinventing the wheel. Uh, we we don't want to do that. Uh, we want to take the great work that is already out there and and be able to put it in a way that that we can expand upon it, that we can uh, increase the flow of of students into uh, the various uh, pipelines that exist and programs that exist out there, and then and then make it available make it available to students, make it available to parents, make it available to teachers. Uh, I think that's that's kind of the theme that we see uh, specifically playing out in the conversations that we have every other week in our subcommittee, you know, really looking at, um, you know, how to how to really um, take take what's out there and, and, and expand upon it and make it available. So I put this slide in relatively, uh, this was a new one, is, is in, and this has really come from Ed and the conversations that he's had with our, with our subcommittee. And I, and I think that, you know, as I, as I reflect upon, you know, where we, we have come, uh, you know, in, this, in the task force and in the fact that the FAA has accelerated, I think, uh, where they're going with regards to workforce, um, I think it, it, it's important that we pause here just a moment to really reflect on, you know, STEM AVSED, uh, its its mission and what it's doing, and and how it may apply to one or individual subcommittees, but more impor importantly, and I think to Ralph's point, uh, we've had a great deal of conversation with Ed about the sustainability of of STEM AVSED um, moving forward, uh, and that it doesn't become uh, just something that is um, just like that removed from an FAA line item uh, in the 2023 FAA reauthorization bill. Uh, so I think that's important. I think also, I think all of us 
as an industry, uh, you know, we're very, very aware of the 2018 Reauthorization Act. We, we know Section 625 and that, that bill, you know, outlined this litany of, of, of activity that, that the FAA um, was directed to do. And, um, and when you stop, and, and obviously this task force is one of those of, of many things uh, that the FAA was doing around workforce. And so, so I, I, I take the pause here to really talk about STEM Avset because I really believe that, you know, with the, the, I don't even know if it's doubling, it might be quadrupling down now of, of what Administrator Dixon is doing uh, and the vision that he has for the FAA around, around workforce and the importance that the administration, I think, can play in helping us as, as, a, as an industry, um, you know, meet the desired demands that, that, that are being faced on, on our industry with regards to the, the shortages that we had prior to the COVID pandemic. Uh, I think the shortages that we're all experiencing now as we, we are recovering, and though we're not close, I think, to really completely recovering, especially internationally, um, there's already uh, a significant amount of pressure being placed to find that, that, that skill we need. And so, you know, Ed is, you know, when you think about Ab, a STEM said, you know, probably about the, the start of, of our committee, we, we didn't, they had like one person, right. And, and that, that one person had, had this nationwide, uh, responsibility and that, that, that is, um, you can see where it, 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 you could, there's only so much time in the day. So I, I think when you look at where, where the FAA is today with the nine regions and, and, and those positions uh, being filled, a redesign of, um, with Sean Torpy and the team of, of the, the, where they are going, I think it's really important that each subcommittee remains connected to this, this, this team uh, and, and make sure that we, we leverage um, you know, the great resources they have, but also the, and the great expertise that they have to ensure that we're, you know, working together in, in unison with, uh, um, you know, with them as well. So um, just kind of wanted to, you know, share, share a little bit of my thoughts and our thoughts as a, as a, as a subcommittee ar around this, um, um, just, just, this, this great organization within the FAA. So as we move, um, and I'll I'll kind of pass this over to my team here. Um, as we as we look at uh, some key observations, I, I think one of the things that our committee, you know, and I'll let I'll let the committee uh, speak here to the individual tasks. But I think one of the things that we as a committee found is we came to these relatively quickly, uh, and I think it's indicative of the fact that I think the you know we as an industry are very very engaged in 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 the fact that we. We kind of see and know the problems that we face. It's just now it's the strategies and the nationalizing of those strategies that that can make it uh, simpler uh, and a lot more attainable for for students entering the pipeline. So, so the first observation uh, we had was centered around uh, was centered around high schools, and I'll let um, I'll let Joel uh, and and Jim uh, go ahead and, and talk a little bit about this. And um, I'll take the middle one. And, and then, of course, Nancy, uh, you and Joel will take uh, uh, the last one. So, Joel, maybe I'll, I'll turn it to you to start and, and yeah. then go ahead and, 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 and pipe up there. Uh, That'd be awesome. Um, so, uh, yeah, this was actually a, a, a really wonderful uh, activity that we at the subcommittee did. Um, and we feel, feel, feels like we've been working on it all year, uh, looking at the different um, opportunities there are for youth programs, whether it's a, a, a summer camp or a scholarship program or, um, or a full-blown um, CTE program built into high schools. And I think all of those have value. Um, what we found is that there, uh, there's definitely value of having very young youth, uh, as in middle school or younger, um, uh, some kind of activities. And, and so uh, those of us who have been uh, involved with like girls in aviation day or, uh, or summer camps for, um, uh, for, for youth centers, um, getting, getting um, students involved in, in middle school or younger um, uh, kind of uh, short circuits, the too cool for school factor, you know, they're young enough to where um, uh, putting their hands on something sounds fun and they're willing to follow through with the fun and say, Hey mom, can I, do this. And so 
got a lot of great examples of that. Um, uh, personally, for me, um, the, the, the most valuable uh, uh, programs are those schools that have a dual enrollment program with high schools um, uh, that, that, that work towards some kind of certification. And so um, uh, I'm in the Part 147 maintenance world. And, um, uh, and so uh, promoting those programs where students in 11th and 12th grade, or even, even earlier, 10th and 11th, 12th grade, um, are able to uh, engage in the exact coursework that can transfer later to a part 147 school, be it community college, university, uh, trade school, um, uh, whatever uh, the format, uh, but be transferable um, uh, to speed up the process, to, um, uh, uh, to get them started and, and have something to finish is, is a powerful thing. Um, I think I said earlier, uh, the AIM schools have five campuses or six campuses now that are uh, doing this, and um, uh, at, but but of course we're we're far from alone at that. Um, uh, everything from aviation high school to to uh, high schools all over the country that are engaging with Part One Forty Seven to get that process started um, uh, is is important. Um, I'll tell you, a lot of the schools that are doing this are doing it at no charge to the high school. Um, like I said, I. I personally don't feel that that is sustainable, even though it's certainly generous and benevolent, um, uh, it's not necessarily sustainable because, um, uh, you know, uh, one budget gets cut and the free stuff immediately goes away. And, and so um, I think some, some work on um, maybe federally being able to help fund those kinds of projects would be, would be a good thing, um, but, uh, but those are the kind of, kind of things that we saw going on and happy to turn it over to Jim for, uh, for his uh, additions. Great, thanks Joel, appreciate that. Ryan team, it's uh, been really good working with everybody. I'm just gonna add on to what Joel said a little bit there. One of the things that we've recognized um, and a lot of committee members have pointed out that the importance of reaching students at a younger age and in the high school environment. There are some restrictions for doing that. You know, it's great when we can do up a full uh, dual credit program like Joel does and I do and several other schools do in certain instances, but not all high schools have the ability or the space or the bandwidth to do that. So one of the things our team has really talked about is we would like to see the FAA adopt some nationally approved curriculum like Choose Aerospace or AOPA or NCATC or NC3. These are all already out there and not necessarily as an entire curriculum, but as pieces and portions of the of existing curriculum. So that would allow a high school to give a certification. And um, those of you that work in the high school environment know that it, it is imperative for CTE high school programs to give a certification of some sort to their students. Their funding all depends on this. And by adopting already accepted uh, curriculum, because all of those that you see listed on the slide there are part of different 147 programs or other programs across the country. We have some in our 147, we have one in, in our 141 program that are used by the high schools, but they are not the full FAA certification. So we are looking for some smaller certifications that will get people started in the aviation field, because that's the hardest part as we've, ad we've identified is getting people going, and that's a good way to do it. And that really ties into the third bu a bullet that it removes some of the cost barriers. Um, as you know, aviation education can be very, very expensive depending on the programs that are offered. By allowing the use of smaller certification uh, by the FAA, we can expand those out to more high schools. You will find, at least in my opinion, that most uh, two-year schools and universities like to work with their high school partners. And as Joel pointed out, it's not sustainable for us to completely pay for other programs long-term. Short-term, sure, but long-term, it's not sustainable. So we want to make this cheaper for them. By removing the cost barrier, we can allow more programs to happen at the high school level and bring more people into our industry. And it really, those, those, credentialing, those credentials that we're talking about will transfer directly or could be transferred directly into a 147 or a 141 or another aviation program, if, assuming the FAA would approve those. Ryan, your thoughts on that? No, I think that's perfect. And, and, and I think we see some, some real opportunity in conversations uh, between now and the next task force meeting of, of really engaging with the FAA and thinking about the framework by which, you know, 
uh, some of these more stackable or what I call almost unbundling of the FAA certificate might be able to be applied. And then as you, as you gain these unbundled credentials, you can bring them ultimately into a full-blown 141 program, 147 program, uh, or something like that. And so great work, Joel and James, on, on that one in particular. I, I really appreciate the effort. Uh, with regards to teachers, we've talked a lot about this already and the importance that I think parents play uh, in, 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 in helping a student make a career choice. And so um, a little bit unbeknownst to me, and maybe because I wasn't paying attention, uh, I, I didn't realize the, the great impact, uh, the, the, the museums that were on the agenda today. And I think one of the things that uh, John Hornibrook and I, who um, you know was, was on the task force, but uh, uh, we're still staying in contact with him on, is, is just the importance that I think museums can play geographically to creating ultimately summer teaching camps. We've had great uh, collaboration with the Awareness Committee, the Trends Committee, uh, around this, we've had calls with the Smithsonian and the and the teacher program that they're doing, um, you know, up there is or in DC as well. And I, and I think that there's once again, it's another theme of let's not reinvent the wheel here. Let's let's take a look at what's going on and how can we take you know some of those good good examples of teaching academies and and really apply that on on a national level. And I and I really think. I just had a conversation yesterday with the uh, Strategic Air Command Museum um, uh, just outside of Omaha, Nebraska. And, you know, I thought as we started ch chatting with them uh, about the work that we're doing in this committee, I, I think they see and saw very quickly, you know, we already have these outreach programs, but could we develop this nationalized curriculum that is pretty consistent and standard with regards to what is being taught uh, for teachers and to do it more geographically that doesn't uh, that doesn't have so much of the expense maybe of of of, of a lot of travel uh, associated. So so more work to be had there. But I, I think between um, um, the, the the committees themselves, the subcommittees themselves, um, you know, pretty good collaboration around uh, creating some pretty strong recommendations of how do we engage and uh, teachers and parents on a level that uh, could be consistent nationally. So. With that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to uh, Joe uh, and then Nancy to uh, talk about uh, the last bullet here uh, on information is critical. Ryan, hey, fine. It's going to be Nancy. Oh, sorry. Nancy and then Joe. Okay. Yes, sorry. Nancy oh, and then sorry. Joe. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Ryan. Um, and, uh, you know, again, thanks to the whole subcommittee and to everybody on the task force. You know, what's so interesting to me as we start talking about this information is critical piece is we've been working at this a long time. And I know for most of us, we've been working on this sort of for our whole careers. Um, and we're still learning where there is this fragmented, you know, lack of, of information all in one spot. Ryan, you, you made a perfect point, you know, talking about the, the museum piece. This is something that we haven't really talked about in our subcommittee, but just it's another element that's out there. And all of this information is critical to getting more people into these careers. Um, but as, as we've said before, as I think all of the groups have talked about today, you know, it's, it's fragmented. It's in lots of different places. And if you don't know how to connect the dots, how to weave all the pieces together, then it's great that they all exist, but it's, it's, we're not, really uh, working to our full potential with the information that's out there. So I know we've talked about this in <clears throat> lots of groups, but this idea of a centralized clearinghouse for that one-stop shopping um, is important. And I think it's great that we're starting to talk about how our subcommittees can work together um, on some of these topics. Um, you know, uh, and that second bullet point, just to point out again, you know, this idea that all these pathways exist, but how to enter them is, is still a mystery in a lot of places. And, and it's not because nobody wants to find them. It's just a question of how to get there. Um, in fact, I think the, the point made earlier about trying to find even aviation uh, college programs for those who are looking for them. I mean, we, we all may know where to look or at least where to start, um, but for somebody who just doesn't have that, that foundational information, what do you even search for in, in a Google search for it?
Uh oh. Nancy, can you hear us? I, for a minute there, I thought that was like a rhetorical question. <laughs> yeah, okay. okay. I was glad it Joe, was go me. ahead. Yeah, yeah. I, I, can, I can pick up on that. Um, I'm sure Nancy will be back. Ryan, actually, why don't you just, if you wouldn't mind, we'll advance to the next slide because it does all tie together. Um, and I know that we're going into group conversation after this, so I don't want to um, talk too long. Actually, I'm the third and fourth bullets, but Ryan, do you think you've covered enough? Um, number one and number two next steps. So I can just jump yep. to three and four. Yep, okay. please. Um, not anything new. We've all talked about the one-stop shop. I think what's really important here and what Ryan emphasized for us earlier in this presentation is the role of AppSed. Um, we have talked about what I've heard earlier today, you know, what umbrella organization should manage this? Do we need to create a new one? Um, I know that we're not um, necessarily fully solutioning right now, but I think it's really important to recognize the existence of AVSED, um, the, the, the robust reach they can have, that they have had pre-pandemic, the rebuilding um, the team has been doing over the last 18 months, and the fact that there is a foundation. And it would be wonderful to know that we could build on top of a strong foundation instead of having to start from, from below ground, if you will. Um, the, the role of FAA can't be underestimated here when we are talking about funding. I know that came up earlier as well. Have we talked about scope, what it would cost to build something like this? What are the resources needed? Again, building on something that already exists gives us some great leverage about how to modernize. And I know we're all embracing modernization innovation, um, live it, living in a digital space. And that's really what this is. I think we all agree we can't continue to use technology that worked for us a decade ago um, or that appeals to those of us who are part of a more seasoned set versus um, some of the youth that we're trying to attract. Those require different tools and different approaches. And so I think what we're really talking about here is modernizing something that speaks to what we've talked about today parents, students from a variety of ages, assistance for the guidance counselors and assistance for the teachers. If we could offer a really steady assist for all of them. Um, we've talked a lot of times about how to make things sticky. How do we keep somebody sticky in aviation? Again, um, you know, if we knew we had it, well, there is another Top Gun movie coming. If we knew we were gonna have the Top Gun effect like we had in the eighties, then to the point earlier, is it important that we that we follow the data and that we know how many, maybe not, but it, we do have a chance to start and gather some data now. And if we had this single entry point where someone makes themselves sticky, there is some type of a registration or an opt-in regardless of student, teacher, parent, we can then follow, follow the data, follow the trail that they've given us. And um, this is not something unique to expanded pathways. So we've been having a lot of great conversations after the last few weeks and months about how we could work with other subcommittees. Um, Sharon, I think that's where you're starting to drive us. And I know our team is really excited about that. Um, we certainly don't have all the ideas. Uh, there's no pride of ownership, but we, we think that we're all heading in the same direction. And certainly the ABSED partnership has been really strong. And then the final point, the virtual counselor, which we have brought up, I mean, that's not a unique bullet point for us, but I think we're, again, starting to cement that conversation. You know, when you think about um, sharing what you shared in New York City, you know, a thousand students to one guidance counselor, and they're not just talking about aviation. They're probably not talking about aviation. Again, modernizing, digitizing, what is something we could create where you're getting something customized because you've entered a platform, you've indicated the areas of interest, and um, we've all done it. We've all interacted with somebody virtually from a customer service standpoint or at, uh, click this for help. And so that is really what that concept is. And I think it will be not a replacement of guidance counselors, but a real asset to a guidance counselor who feels that they're overwhelmed and can say, I can get you directed to here. Um, and then finally, all of this just leads to what is the strategy? What is the national communication plan? What is the strategy to do this, to roll this out? Again, I thought that was a great discussion earlier today, and I think we need to create that strategy together. Thank you so much, team, and I'll turn it over to you, Sharon. Yeah, terrific. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, so just it reminded me, you know, we don't have a national 
standard for education, right? That's the states set the standard, right? Um, but there are funding sources for creating new partnerships. They're called PTEC grants. So we're doing one with Freeport High School out on Long Island. So they will start to take courses in ninth grade. And the idea is by the end of high school, although they'll have to take one or two courses with us after that, but they will actually graduate with a high school diploma and an associate's degree. So there's some really neat, and, and that way to, to Joel and Jim's point, it can get funded. Now to the funding group's point, it takes a lot of work to get those grants. And they're typically, there's a one-year planning grant and then it's a five-year grant. So you do have to rewrite them every six years. Um, but uh, but yeah, but it, it does give you some, there are some opportunity, P-T-E-C-H. Um, so that's one thing you might wanna look for. The other thing I wanted to ask quickly before we get into the bigger discussion is apprenticeships. Has the committee looked at apprenticeships, especially expanding them to the high school level as an entry point um, to reaching young people? I think, I think great. Great comment. And yes, it's also part of our tasking. I, I know just kind of speaking on AAR's component, you know, we did get down, uh, finally got approval through the Department of Labor uh, for a national program um, in all of our maintenance repair and overhaul centers. And we also finally got VA approval also so that uh, students who are our employees can use their housing allowance while they're in an apprenticeship program, which is, which is pretty, uh, it's a pretty significant um, uh, opportunity for 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 them, and I think uh, we have had uh, some good conversations with Dallas College. As another example, they're going to be implementing pre apprenticeship program, a sheet metal program. Uh, mm -hmm. Both, uh, you know, they're looking at uh, mostly eighteen to thirty year olds um, at this point, but they're also looking having conversations with several Dallas high schools with regards to uh, moving students through a particular program which is what we do in South Chicago through our sheet metal program in South Chicago. They go from uh, South Chicago sheet metal program into one of our apprenticeship programs within our maintenance bases. So I, I think that is an area that uh, clearly the Department of Labor has gotten tremendous amounts of funding for. Um, states are, um, especially the state of Illinois has definitely doubled down with regards to the efforts uh, around pre-apprentice and apprenticeship programs by by using some of their COVID dollars to expand those programs. So mm -hmm. I think, um, um, you know, just, just from my own experience, uh, I, I definitely see uh, those opportunities and helping to streamline the process. Um, we worked with a, um, an organization called Accelerate Apprenticeship Programs uh, out of Hampton Roads, Virginia. Uh, Barbara Murray, uh, who some of you may know, uh, she has worked extensively with us to help navigate. Uh, once again, it's another one of those um, great program, but really hard to get off the ground without somebody who understands uh, the process through the Department of Labor. And then more importantly, you know, uh, unfortunately, labor doesn't talk to the VA at all. And, and trying to get <laughs> that done is also been a little bit of a challenge, but I'm but but accelerated apprenticeship has really helped us. Um, state approving agencies have been helpful uh, with regards to the Valor Act, which uh, which which allows you to work through a singular state instead of multi-state locations. Uh, but definitely, um, I, I think an area of focus and and one I'll I'll definitely share and bring up on our our next subcommittee call. Yeah, and just to double back, and then I'll go to you, Tamara, on with funding, right? We've had conversations with some who are looking at Title IV funds and this idea of using apprenticeships and federal work study dollars, right? So it would allow the students to um, earn an income while they're in an apprenticeship, which can help pay some of the costs, right? So, but it, it's... Um, it's not very tested yet. I think there are a few examples of it, but it's another way to help students fund the cost is to have, you know, say a, an MRO was gonna do an apprenticeship program. They could use federal work study dollars, which the institution has to actually pay them to, to, with that time, right? So now the student doesn't have to choose between the apprenticeship and work. They can right. use the apprenticeship time as paid time. 
So just something to keep in mind. Good. Hey, Tamara. You, you guys hit right on both of the points that uh, that I was going to ask and still want to see if we can have a little bit more discussion on. And that was seeing that our job is to get more youth on pathways into careers in aviation and aerospace. The biggest the biggest break that I have seen, and I know, um, Sid, you probably know this too, and anybody in the education space, is that between fourth grade and fifth and, and freshman year in high school, where kids actually have an idea of what they want to do, they just don't have the opportunities to have access to experience what they want to do. And in a lot of underserved communities, they don't even know anyone personally that does what they want to do for a living. And so, um, Ryan, you hit it right on the head with the pre-apprenticeship programs. Uh, our organization, Aerostar, is a pretty small to mid-sized nonprofit. The, out, the numbers that we put out for youth are incredible with, with far as interest and matriculate into the aviation industry. But when we went to apply for uh, workforce dollars for apprenticeships, the outcomes were astronomical that they wanted us to be able to facilitate as a part of an awardee. So for example, they the numbers for electrical apprenticeship programs were like 400 apprentices they wanted to go through the program within two years. And we're thinking, there's, there's no way we can put 400 kids through an apprenticeship program in four years. And so um, the pre-apprenticeship program funding, I think is gonna be critical to meeting that mid-skills gap and at least solidifying that interest um, and getting young people on a pathway. Uh, Sharon, you were also right as well. Our most successful programs have been those where students received a stipend. And for underserved communities, they start work at 15, 16 years old. And they actually, um, some get work permits like I did to start working at 14 um, because they are part of the household income. Mm -hmm. And it's really important, um, you know, for the, the family infrastructure. We haven't, we've talked a little bit about parents, but that is a huge part of what needs to happen in, uh, in communities, rural communities where older siblings are basically head of household after school um, and being able to have opportunities for young people to actually earn while they learn and pre-apprenticeship programs at the high school level is really going to be critical to feeding even the community college pipeline, um, let alone you know um, the actual full-blown training programs, which like you said, Sharon, are basically nine to five, um, nine to five opportunities. And Ryan, we saw it here, an excellent program in Chicago, struggled to get people to enroll because who can take 10 weeks off of quit their job to take 10 weeks to go into a training program for a certificate, then they have to go look for another job after doing 10 weeks of, of, of sheet metal work. So, um, you know, maybe this is something, Ralph, that, that we can talk more specifically about as a funding committee and look at ways to fund that. It's literally a mid-skills gap for kids, right? <laughs> Because we see that in adults, you know, in between transitioning to careers or just getting your foot in the door. But I don't know if we've really thought about workforce development from a youth perspective and what that looks like. Uh, many of us in aviation know that kids have been flying uh, since they were 14, 13 years old. They have to wait to get, you know, checked out and they solo uh, and they have to wait to solo because they get introduced to aviation so young. Um, but when we have opportunities to, to bridge those skills gaps, um, funding that portion of the pipeline is probably gonna be very critical to the workforce component because we know that the trends are ebbing towards direct to workforce from high school. And funding post-secondary and um, you know math and science is, is awesome and STEM but I think individual industries um, like the FAA, Ryan, I think you hit it right on the head where we might be underestimating the power that the FAA has uh, and the leverage of what ASVAC can do to move this initiative uh, specifically for workforce in the industry um, uh, as our focus and not really 
you know, try to do, you know, STEM or, you know, anything at large, but aviation specifically with aviation jobs and looking for that mid skills um, training opportunities um, between eighth grade and high school graduation. Mm -hmm. And many of you guys know, you know, our parents and, and kids that grew up with us were fixing cars and all type of stuff in high school, taking stuff apart, putting these kids can do it. It's not it's not that they can't do it. Um, they don't have the opportunities to get those licenses, certifications and, and credentials uh, by the time they graduate high school, because most of the vocational trades have been pulled from the from the schools. Thank you, Tamara. Yeah, Ralph. You're on mute. I agree with Tamara. I, I think that there is a, uh, a need to look at the, the whole pipeline. I think those uh, gaps are really important to uh, consider. I think that, uh, that some of our, our funding ideas would cover those gaps uh, if there are programs that would be focused on, on those kinds of areas. But another thing that I think uh, is really critical for us to all consider as all the other subcommittees that are dealing with all of these with the whole pipeline. And uh, Tamara began to touch on, on uh, the needs of some of the underserved populations. Uh, those and many others uh, have the same kind of problem in terms of lack of awareness of what they should be doing academically in order to be prepared to go into those jobs. So it's not only enough to be able to say, mm -hmm. okay, this is what it takes to be a maintenance technician or a pilot or an engineer, uh, that's great, but by the time you get to the end of high school, and if you hadn't taken the preparatory courses necessary to qualify to go into those fields, like the math and the science that are needed in a lot of those uh, uh, those areas, uh, you're going to be out of luck, even if you want to at that point. So I think that one of the things that uh, that uh, uh, trends and awareness need to consider is uh, to be able to uh, promote, uh, maybe through guidance counselors or other ways that it's important to take certain courses during the course of your pipeline career at school from K through 12 and maybe 16, what are the things you need to take to qualify to enter those kinds of, uh, of job areas? Uh, and so, for example, if you want to be an engineer and you don't take enough math, by the time you're end, out of, end, ending high school, you're out of luck, unless you go back and take that math again. That I'm sure the same is true for other areas as well. So what are those courses that the people need to be aware of uh, so that they can begin to think about taking them in time to be able to be prepared? Yeah, thank you, Ralph. So we can move into the general conversation. I do still wanna to try to finish um, at 1145, 1150 so that we can um, hear from Amy and Jennifer. So if you have general comments, please feel free to make them. Go ahead, Ryan. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, I, I think another thing we could look into um, just some of the experiences that we've had at AAR are the work, the work that workforce boards do have uh, in communities. And I'll give you an example. So Rockford, work for, the Workforce Connection in Rockford uh, provides a lot of unique funding opportunities for, you know, high school, you know, high school students, as well as, you know, kind of post-secondary students. And, and one of the examples and how we use them is that we recognize that taking students out of South Chicago, many of those students have never left Chicago. Um, and we're asking them to move to Rockford, Illinois. In a lot of ways, we might as well ask them to move to the Galapagos Islands, right? Because they've never moved before, they haven't experienced a move before, and they don't have the resources necessary uh, even though we pay for the move as a part of the company, there's there's way more to it uh, than that. And the Rockford Workforce Connection, we actually um, put them into a six per, uh, six month OJT transition program through the Workforce Connection, which 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 provides them childcare, uh, transportation mm -hmm. services, health services, and it's just this 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 litany of wraparound services opportunities that the individual can can use or or not use based upon you know their individual need and we and we found though though we it's been a small a steady stream of of, of students from all of harvey college to rockford as a facility um you know we're, we're seeing pretty good success and i think it's another 
example where there is funding available just don't know the funding is available, right? And so I think as we look at, you know, their funding is coming through uh, the Department of Economic uh, uh, Commerce and Opportunities uh, folks, that's that's where their funding comes from. And there's ever, ever, a lot of cities have workforce boards or counties or, or have workforce boards that I think could be tapped into by, by industry to help with some of those wraparound services. Because I think they are, if you want to move the needle, right, in, in underrepresented populations in aviation, we have to recognize, you know, first and foremost, if you're going to do that, there's, you got to, you got to be as an industry partner, a whole lot more engaged, because there are things that, that those students and soon to, and employees need that, you know, um, maybe others don't. And, and that's, that's, we just, we just need to be aware of that and, and, and leverage the opportunities that are out there uh, from a funding perspective. So, yeah, that's a that's a great point. I mean, you know, I kind of opened with that about the student emergency assistance fund, right? To give, right? But we connect students to SNAP benefits, to unemployment benefits, especially over the last eighteen months, right? And that we know that in order for students to be successful, they need a structure. In a lot of cases, same thing to retain employees. So this, I think this. Um, this is a great conversation to pivot into this idea of AVSED and the nine regions. And, you know, are we starting to think that those regional coordinators can be the people who are the conveners of all the pieces in the puzzle, right? The higher ed institutions, the industry, the museums, the, you know, the, the conveners to create those aviation ecosystems, the local airports, the right, so that, you know, maybe bringing DOL into the conversation, you know, the local chamber of commerce into the conversation, the right, that that you can then start to have these, you know, crossing streams conversations, right, where there is lots of sharing and collaboration, which has come up again and again and again, right, and also an ability to point to resources. Um, so it sounds like those nine regions might be sort of a, a convening point to create these um, very integrated uh, ecosystems. So, yeah, Brett, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add into that point. I think this is a great opportunity to introduce a concept that's become really important for us at ARSA on a workforce development front which is in, in that term, in terms of convening, also bringing the things the agency, the FAA is doing that maybe on their face, don't even feel like they are workforce development venues or career development venues. If you look at them, um, you know, as an example, we're very involved in this, the safety oversight and certification action committee, whatever SOCAC actually stands for, right, which was stood up to provide an oversight venue for the FAA certification process and safety management related to it. It's become a bit of a silver bullet for career and workforce development because we've used it as a venue to think about how the agency defines its skills needs where those skills needs fit into a larger workforce pipeline discussion, and also how they impact the ability of the industry to do its work, right? So if we're here stimulating interest in advanced technology and new startups that are gonna do really exciting things with advanced air mobility and commercial space and you know, all these things that get a lot of column in inches in the general media, well, how does the agency respond to that? And the way it structures its skills and capabilities in terms of being able to react to growth in the industry, will also feed our ability to generate excitement about work that's being done, and also recognizing that you know the person we get interested in aviation today, hopefully will be a great pilot or maintainer or ground ops person or support person, but also could wind up in the agency themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's gonna be something that feeds and, and you know, supports back development on all fronts. So, so in that convening spirit, you know, between all the groups that are going and work that's going on out in the agent, outside of the agency, we can bring the discipline to say, okay, where does workforce as part of a DNA, a part of our DNA fit into all the things that the agency is doing in terms of training and growth and development? Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a great point. This idea of they're not only it's not just this way, it's also back the other way too, right? That they're also using the resources of the, all the resources or of the FAA to bear on that particular region that I wouldn't know about, right? Sure. I didn't know about that group, right? So, but if my FAA regional rep is very well connected to everything that's going on in the FAA, they could bring that to bear in the conversations. Well, I think that's a great point. Yeah, go ahead, Yvette. Yeah. Um piggybacking off the FAA ABSET office, totally 100% support their outreach work. We've seen just so much more engagement and the regionalization I think is a good thing. One thing I've been struggling with, and, and I think this has come up at some of the other meetings is sort of the term STEM. Um, and while it got you know all this buzz and we've seen so much um, sort of emphasis on it, it's really become part of FAA's sort of genre and really in the ABSED name. And so I just wonder if we're, you know, potentially leaving behind some kids that see the word STEM and don't really <laughs> have any interest in it. And to the point about, you know, students not having enough um, math or science courses, I mean, especially in underserved communities, that's not, you know, to put that on the student. It's, um, I think a lot more can be done on the labor workforce industry development side where it may not be coursework, but it's training. It's that apprenticeship. It's, mm -hmm. you know, developing those kids, not just based on their um, curriculum or classroom experience. So I just, I'm just struggling, I think a little bit with mm -hmm. STEM and whether we think beyond or you know, just want to kind of throw that out for discussion or thought. Do you think technical education has the same math science connotation? Absolutely not. Yeah, I don't. I don't. I don't think so at all. Yeah. Uh, and I. I just wanted to. I just. To, I'm so glad you brought that up because I wanted to. Um, I wanted to share when we were talking about you know the requirements and what can be done for young people to get on pathways. I literally hadn't looked this up in years. So just a couple of weeks ago, I looked up the requirements to become a private pilot. Now I teach kids how to become pilots and do we do pilot training and we get them ready for careers. You must be at least 16 years old to fly solo, which means you can start flying at any age before 16. You must be at least 17 years old to receive your pilot's license. You have to read, speak, write, and understand English. And that's, that's a big one obtain at least a third class medical and perform basic math, which is addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. That's it. We, we can make things too hard and it's not that hard. But can I argue a little bit here? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So, so, you know, the 60 credits that our pilots have to take in arts and sciences, help them manage the cockpit, think critically, right um communicate well right those are those are skill sets that are are being reinforced in their flight classes but happen in english happen in in history happen in right those i would argue those are still skill sets that we need for somebody who's going to take me to memphis right absolutely but i'm but i'm saying i've had kids with add adhd c average get in the plane and, and get 20 hours of flight time before high school graduation. Oh, yeah, no, I'm not arguing that at oh, all. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so to get to the, air, you know, to flying passengers, right? Yeah. Okay, there's a skill set that comes with a degree. But, but, but think about the numbers also. How many young people that get private pilot's licenses actually go on to become airline pilots? Those are the people that we want and could absolutely use. And I see, Brett, you shaking your head. Yeah, absolutely use across the industry. Half right. the people that worked for the aviation consulting firm that I worked for for years were licensed pilots, some of the best aviation consultants in the world. And so when we talk about pathways and careers, access to careers, I think that the private pilot's license creates access to an aviation job, not a pilot job. And that's an argument that I make Fine. On, yeah. a regular, on a regular basis. Yeah. Point. That is a great point. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, when you're talking about maintenance technicians, right, the thing they need most is tool aptitude, right? Yeah. They, 
Nobody messes with their, I mean, Tamara, people mess with their cars, but not like they used to. And everything's a computer chip now. You know, so for our maintenance training students, we're teaching them how to use a wrench, right? So, you know, there's, there are absolutely different skills. I forget who said this. I think it was Ralph about this idea of different skills to go with each career, right? Um, you know, we know, we know where the hard parts are for um, maintenance students, right? It tends to be electrical systems, right? We know where the hard parts are for, um, for management students. We know where the hard parts are for engineering students, right? So there's these places where if they come to us with the right skill set, it just makes their life that much easier. But we know at our level, we're going to have to do some of that work too, right? We can't just say, you know, they should come fully formed to college. It doesn't always happen that way, right? So some of this is about collaboration, right? Me having conversations with Stephen Jackson at Aviation High School or, you know, those feeder schools to say, how do we get in and help you and make, you know, the pathway easier for students? So, okay, great. Yeah, Ralph. I have a couple of points I want to make. Uh, one is starting with your initial co uh, comment about AVSED. Uh, I think that the regional approach that AFSET is going to is really important. I, they've had that approach before. Uh, AFSET has had a number of iterations in terms of the way they've uh, uh, dealt with this kind of thing. But the regions are really important. Having a regional uh, a administrator that can really focus the efforts in that part of the country mm -hmm. is very, very important. But it's also important not to uh, forget the 1,600 employees that can go out to schools and support program initiatives across the country. I know that uh, that for our program, the Real World Design Challenge, AVSED has helped us out uh, regionally and with the employees. Many of the employees have served as mentors and judges for our program. Uh, they, they, they are a valuable asset uh, that should not be ignored. Uh, they have a lot of expertise. They are, are wonderful people to work with. Uh, and uh, that kind of, of commitment from the agency uh, is really, really important. So when the uh, administrator says, yeah, we really want you to go out and, and do this as a volunteer, uh, it means that the employee has the knowledge that it's okay for them to, to uh, volunteer and use their expertise in that way. So that kind of support from the agency, I think, is really critical in supporting programs across the board. The other point that I'd like to, to make is that uh, people have been talking in, on, in this discussion uh, about competencies that are required for various kinds of uh, uh, aviation or aerospace jobs. Well, the Department of Labor has developed in collaboration with AIA and NDIA uh, a very comprehensive aerospace competencies model, which is on their website. And it details all of the requirements and expectation, job expectations and competencies that a person needs for every single job. Did you and that is, that is extant and available. Did you say NDIA? The National Defense Industries Association. Yes, NDIA and AIA work to labor to develop an aerospace competencies model. It's very, very detailed. It uh, it has resumes. It has it has job requirements. It has competencies. It has baseline expectations in terms of expectations. It's basically a pyramid with a lot of data in terms of what's required. Tamara uh, cited the specifics for one particular job, but this is a one-stop shop for all the jobs in aerospace. So it's a great resource for anybody that's interested in that kind of thing. Great, thank you. Amy, then Sid, and then we're, we've got about five minutes and then we're gonna move to the museum's discussion. Yeah, I wanted to um, kind of continue the conversation that, that started. Um, I think that there's an important distinction between um, saying, uh, aviation careers require a STEM focus. Um, you could reframe that and say kids with STEM, you know, aptitude towards STEM should consider a career in aviation. Um, and then you can kind of also say if, if you don't have a STEM aptitude, there are still careers that are available to you in this field. Um, I personally didn't have a STEM background and, and am in aviation and have a successful career. And there's lots of jobs at my company specifically in design and things like that, that actually focus more in arts than, than actually in, in aviation in any STEM. So I do think it's really important that um, whatever the ultimate um, conversations about recommendations end up being is that they're inclusive of non 
um, non-STEM programming specifically, um, but that we can also have other specific or other conversations around STEM saying, hey, look, if you have aptitude for math and sciences, engineering, things like that, that you do consider these types of careers within aviation. Yeah, great point. Thank you. I mean, you know, I'm starting to picture the one stop shop already. And, you know, there's one bucket that says, you know, do you like to take things apart and put it back together? You know, do you like to fly? You know, do you like math and science? Do you right? <laughs> so that we kind of cover the waterfront. So, okay, go ahead, Sid. Yes, I just wanted to piggyback earlier on what uh, I think it was Rap who mentioned something about students being aware at an early age, some of the courses that may be needed or are out there. Uh, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I currently work with a group of African American boys in the after school program, and we have um, high school students who were previously in the program who will be returning uh, to share with the young men. Uh, they, they are all in AP computer science now. And so just to have them return uh, uh, to the program to share with the current students uh, the math classes that they're taking, as well as being able to do some type of hands-on activity with them. I think they're going to do cybersecurity this year. Um, I don't want us to underestimate the power of students mentoring students. Um, so, Raph, you're definitely on point in having, you know, maybe students returning to share um, courses that uh, students are able to take at a later age. Yeah, great point. They don't want to hear from us. <laughs> right? They want to hear from, from kids their age, right? Or at least closer in their age. Yes, and they are definitely great mentors. Yeah. All right, terrific. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And we, we will continue the conversation, I promise. Um, you know, if you have any additional thoughts, please feel free to reach out to the subcommittee chairs directly, or you can reach out to me, Angela, uh, whatever works for you. So, yeah, so very excited to have Amy Spowart, who's the president and chief executive officer for the National Aviation Hall of Fame in Riverside, Ohio. She's also a, mo a member of the Women's Advisory Board as well as Jennifer Baxmeyer, who's the executive director for the Cradle of Aviation Museum located in Garden City, New York. So thank you both for being here. Um, I'm sure you've been biting your tongue wanting to get in on the conversation. I can imagine both of you have some great thoughts about what we've been discussing. And so um, you're, you're so fortunate because it's just the two of you for the next you know 20 minutes or so. Um, <laughs> well, I, you know, it, so you can share your ideas and um, so I thought we'd just, you know, sort of do this as a sort of panel discussion and then allow the rest of the task force to jump in. Um, you know, as Ryan put it, and I know Yvette and Joey Colloran have all been involved in talking to uh, museums um, and the important role that they play in the aviation ecosystem. Uh, and so I, I just want to make sure that we have an opportunity to think about the role that you play um, in terms of our larger recommendations for the task force. So first, you know, just a, a check in. How are both of your organizations doing in the midst of the pandemic? Um, Jen, why don't we start with you? Great. Um, we're doing OK. Uh, you know, we still don't have all of the uh, revenue streams coming in. We don't have the school groups back yet. Uh, we're hoping that in the spring, maybe they'll be here. Uh, and we don't have the catering and the large events and, and things like that. But we're doing OK. Our attendance has actually been um, the same as pre-pandemic, if not better. We've had more families coming in, uh, so it's been it's been good, and we've learned how to navigate the federal programs that came through for funding. Were very helpful. Uh, it's put us in a in a um, a good position to um, you know weather the storm, and and we are, and our future looks bright. So we're doing good. Okay. Amy. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting and I am totally biting my tongue, but um, <laughs> you guys have so much going on and there's so much overlap. So it's exciting to see that we're all on the same page yes. with where the FAA groups are going. But, but in terms of the National Aviation Hall of Fame, I'm, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't receive, um, you know, we don't have revenue. Sure. We're free and open to the public, Twenty, you know, 20, all the time. 
So we did we weren't necessarily um, affected in that way. Yes. And in fact, um, while we were closed for uh, COVID, we were able yeah, to kind yeah. of re um, focus our efforts well, and pivot in unique uh, ways that I think this group. I don't know if that's me or if somebody's not on mute. I don't know where that background noise is coming from. I do apologize. But, um, you know, uh, our in 2019, we were up to about 300,000 visitors a year in the Hall of Fame. Uh, now we're about, um, this year, we're about probably about half of that. So it's good. But we have, we have people uh, through and school groups through now. So, um, you know, I'm excited about how we were able to develop our outreach um, that we can certainly talk about. But um, rather than looking inward, we looked outward. And um, we're getting a lot of traction and excitement through those outreach efforts. Terrific. That's great. All right. So, Amy, why don't you take this one? You know, what are you doing in terms of outreach, especially to underserved populations? So um, <clears throat> while, while we weren't able to have people in here, we actually jumped on an opportunity after a conversation I'd had with Sean O'Keefe about two years ago. Um, you know, uh, he shared former with me NASA that former NASA administrator, just for those who don't know. <laughs> yeah, sorry, former NASA administrator and uh, former secretary of the Navy, a great guy. He's currently at Syracuse and really willing to share some advice with me. We sat down for about an hour and a half and he and I said, you know, Sean, what's lacking? What do we need in aviation? And he said, Amy, we need education for kids in elementary school. So I, I kind of sat on that information. And then um, during COVID, actually, I started a, a collaboration with uh, PBS. So the National Aviation Hall of Fame now has uh, a K through six. We have grades one through three done. Um, four through six will be our phase two. And um, pre-K will be our, um, our phase three curriculum. Um, for kids, and it's not um, it's not steam based. It's aviation and aerospace based. So those concepts come first. So we're aviation and aerospace led, steam based, aligned to national standards uh, curriculum. And what we want to do with this, because we're a very small operation, is actually build the pipeline that this group has talked a lot about. So we wanna work with the AOPAs and the FAAs and all those groups that have the older curriculum already done. We wanna create a pipeline and then connect with industry at the end so that, um, so that we can target this curriculum to create the workforce of tomorrow. So if we go to Boeing or United or whoever it is and we say, what, what do we need to tweak in this curriculum so that we're getting this you know, we're creating the workforce in aviation and aerospace that you want, we can do that in real time. We want to do that also by um, educating and not just one touches, but ongoing professional development with teachers, administrators, guidance counselors. And additionally, I heard a lot of talk from your group today uh, about parents. And because our curriculum will be free to under-resourced communities, we need to talk about caregivers, not just parents, because a lot of times these kids do not have a parent at home. They, it may not even be a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle, maybe somebody who's caring for them. So we want to ensure that we can get those folks, as well as teachers and guidance counselors and CTEs, we want those folks to also get, um, you know, touches in the airport so that they can see what's happening. Or maybe we get them flying a drone, we get them interacted. So each kid has a champion at home. So if they say, I want to go into aviation, that we don't have to just depend on the schools or the families, we create a whole ecosystem of support for them. So, and we'll use that here in the National Aviation Hall of Fame because PBS is creating digital media, digital content, and broadcast content that will be shown because under-resourced kids don't necessarily have the ability to use a computer or have cable TV. But, um, Sharon, whenever you said we need Schoolhouse Rock, that's exactly <laughs> what we're doing. We are creating Schoolhouse Rock content for aviation and using our enshrinees as the basis for that. So, um, so that will work inside the Hall of Fame and in the classroom. So. Terrific. Thank you. That sounds great. I, I can, I bet you anything, there's about 12 questions just on what you just said. <laughs> Go ahead, Jen. <laughs> it, it's incredible how much this whole entire time listening to everyone. I mean, it, 
it could be any day here at the cradle. We've had the same conversations. Amy, you're like right on the nose. Uh, we're doing very much similar things. Our approach is very broad. Um, we really need to start the conversations much earlier um, about the industry and the career pathways that are out there. And it starts with the caregivers and parents. And, and so we've done a lot of different uh, ways. It's very multi-layered, a lot of collaboration. You guys, I, I want to dime for every time you guys have said that now during this meeting. Um, it's just so critical. It's key for us. Uh, we've done things like career conversations where we've had key uh, leadership in the industry come in and then they talk to the students, they talk to the parents, they talk to the teachers. Um, so it's, it's really important to get exposure to all of the different audiences, not just um, you know, high school kids that are already kind of maybe decided where they're going. So um, the career conversations and community nights we've done. Um, we've worked specifically with like Freeport School District and we've targeted having them come in with their, you know, network of friends and support systems so that we can just show them all the different areas that are within the aviation industry. It doesn't just have to be a stewardess or, you know, a flight attendant and, and a pilot. There's all these different facets. Um, Amy, you even talked about it. There's art. There's lots of, you know, advertising and marketing and things that go into it. Um, so there's this whole spectrum of career paths that you can go into, and I think getting the audiences earlier. So we've been doing the same at the cradle. We start very young to create this pipeline and just give tons of exposure to um, the students and the parents and teachers. Terrific. All that sounds very expensive. So <laughs> how do you develop funding streams that support well, that outreach? You guys Again, I was talk about wanting to jump in when you guys are talking about the fundraising part. We were like, oh, God, yeah. <laughs> so same. It's just been, uh, you know, the grants are, are great, but you noted they're really competitive and hard and they take a lot of effort. And then to get turned down, it's really disappointing. And sometimes it's not as sustainable. So I think um, really that collaborative part is important and doing that with industry is even better because if you have let's say somebody from JetBlue or one of the you know airlines or you know one of the manufacturing companies from Long Island or the area that you're in and they see the work that you're doing and, and the effort that you're doing they're more likely to fund it um, year after year and they might want to be more involved so We've had better success with getting involved with industry and with partners and having them come on site than the grant programs themselves. However, um, part of that partnership and collaboration, we have found success with grants when we've partnered with school districts specifically on a program. Um, Sharon, you mentioned the P Tech program with Report. We joined them too. Um, so in years past, we that's really where we've had the success with grants has been with if we had a college or a school and or multiple collaborators to go collectively after a grant, that's where we've gotten, um, you know, a successful application. Yeah, Amy? Well, for us, it's imperative to make this free. And not only do we wanna make it free for under-resourced schools, but we wanna actually give uh, classrooms, you know, each classroom $100. So if, you know, a teacher needs anything implementing it, we want to make it as easy as possible, you know, and as well as um, we'll have a 1-800 number for teachers um, that will go directly to the educators at PBS in case there's a real time, um, real time question about how to teach an aviation or aerospace concept. Um, so free is, is, is just imperative. And um, the ways we see to do that is, of course, working with industry, reaching out to Gulfstream, uh, reaching out to Cirrus, who have been great supporters of the Hall of Fame, reaching out to all those um, companies who haven't been decimated by uh, COVID, being fair and recognizing that not everybody has funding sources right now, incorporating the Department of Education and individual states to um, to receive underwriting for this. I was actually in the governor's office um, this week. And last week I was in um, Washington DC and I met with Steve Dixon and talked to him about it. So the FAA can help because this is, 
not just an FAA issue or a um, industry issue, this affects all of us, right? 54, what is it? The FAA recognized 54 career fields in aviation. So I know for me, one of my knee jerk reactions is every time I hear we need more pilots, I'm like, dude, we need everything. So, um, so all, all foundations, all, all industry, I'll take money from anybody, but the unfortunate thing about the Hall of Fame is that I'm the only salaried employee. So I'm the one implementing, I'm the one working the liaison. So um, it's slow, but it's, it's productive. It would be great if there were one top, one stop shop, not just for scholarships like you all are talking about, and like our board is talking about. It's a great idea, but there should also be something I think for nonprofits like Jennifer and I's, where we're really trying to get the message out and the grant writing is so, it's laborious indeed. I mean, it's, it's um, exhaustive. And, and a lot of times um, your scholarship group talked about this um, and because I lead the group that's looking into scholarships as well, sometimes you have to belong to a special club or a special group to apply for funding that totally applies to you. And it's such a barrier. It's such a gap that I'm barred because I'm not women in aviation or, you know, I, I haven't already been identified in a certain way. So we need to make it easier for nonprofits who are trying to fix this problem to apply for funding. Yeah, terrific. And the funding group has absolutely been thinking through those issues, thanks to Tamara, who does this in her day job, right? <laughs> and has to apply for funding all the time. So we- Tamara's a rock star, man. Yeah, we absolutely Look at her, understand. she looks like a rock star. She, actually, she is a rock star. <laughs> you know, so we definitely understand this at a, at a granular level about the effort it takes. So is there, what more would you want to do? I mean, do you have a wish list of things that if you had all the money in the world, you know, we know that the demand is there. We know that we're going to have a really hard time meeting it. You know, what else can we be doing? I mean, I think Amy, you talked about and Jen too about reaching to to this the younger ages. Um, but what are the things that this task force needs to hear that we need to also help push on your behalf? If I can jump in, you said earlier, finding some sort of federal um, sustainable funding, that would be great because it's it's really the museum doesn't, you know, um, I mean, the purpose of our museum is to be basically the megaphone for the industry and celebrate the history, but also um, what's happening, you know, now and in the future and to inspire future generations to go uh, into aviation or aerospace and so having uh, a resource, a place where you can get funding that benefits the community is really just key. So the work that you're doing, thank you. I think that that is um, critical for you know um, wh where we go in the future and how to keep this workforce pipeline going. But then I, I think you guys hit um, on the pop culture part. I think that that was really uh, great. I, I mean, I'm just kind of regurgitating what you already said, but the pop culture, it's so important to have that hook. And you guys use the term sticky. That's exactly how you get the sticky going because, um, you know, if you if you show them how many people were like, I was inspired by comic books or science fiction, you know, there are, you know, all these different elements of pop culture that I think um, get you or get younger people engaged and just get that little hook. And then once they get that little buzz, the next thing you know, they're in and they're excited about it. And then it's not a hard sell anymore. They just want to be involved in the industry. So, um, you know, things that are, maybe there's something where there's a pop culture section where there's all these, you know, cool and interesting people that they see every day, whether it's on TikTok or in a movie or in music or something that they're like, oh, wow, they're, they're a pilot or, you know, whatever in their former life, they were machinists. I don't know, just, just cool stuff that I think um, would, would make it um, knowledgeable and, and broad for parents to be like, see, this person is a pilot. You can go do that or, or for a student for that matter to see it. So I, I like the pop culture aspect and we try to do that here at the museum too. So I, I think that's fun. Yeah, you guys are great at using some of those pop culture pieces, Thanks. you know, to pull people into the museum, right? They do a Thank lot of video, video gaming yep. as an entry point to get into the museum. So, yeah. Amy. 
Um, I want to applaud whoever came up with the virtual guidance counselor. Whoever, wh whoever did that on this group is flipping genius. That is outstanding. I had never heard that before. I think it's absolute genius. Um, I think it's imperative that we meet youth where they are, right? Like Jennifer just said, social media is imperative. We also uh, need to see it to be it. So we need to amplify people like Cortland Savage from Fly for the Culture, Nia uh, Woodward Law from um, who flies for United Airline, who founded Soul Sisters. Um, this is in the skies. This is, thank you, Tamara. Yeah, we need I was to with Nia last night. <laughs> ah, that's awesome. We need to amplify uh, folks like that because um, it's my biggest fear and another part of the inspiration for the Hall of Fame's direction right now is that. We have a little kid in a classroom who um, may be in an inner city school or a rural area who says, I want to fly. And there's either no airport or there's no um, teacher or there's a caregiver in a place where they don't have what they need, the resources. They don't know who to call. They don't know where to go. And here we have a little, you know, a little genius who wants to be an engineer and design aircraft like Kelly Johnson, you know, like um, we need to ensure that if there's a, a child who lives in a, a, in a, a little girl who's in uh, like a culture, a, a, who is being brought up in a culture that doesn't celebrate women working beyond high school, that they have opportunities, that they have exposure and that there are people in place that can um, kind of help them find their dreams. So that's, a, I, I don't know how to do that, but I'd certainly love to work on a solution. Terrific. Thank you both. Okay, I'd like to open it up to the task force. Who has a question? First of all, Amy, I just want to thank you and Jennifer for your presentations. Um, we have been working really hard to not seek validation, but get feedback from outside parties to kind of encourage us and to let us know that we're at least on the right track. So I know that I speak for everyone when I say thank you so much for reinforcing a lot of the hard work uh, and findings that we've been, I mean, a lot of it we knew going into this task force, but we really just didn't have the information and the and the site the citing sources to back it up, and you guys really came on here and did that for us, uh, Amy. I I actually um, I was at the I, I'm a delegate for the Illinois Aviation Hall of Fame uh, 20, 2017 inductee, and uh, last night we had the Illinois Aviation Hall of Fame uh, induction ceremony, and um, I probably was the youngest person in the room except for the people that brought their kids. Um, I'm the youngest person on the delegation of 20 of us. I'm the only African-American on the delegation. And in the history of the Illinois Aviation Hall of Fame, most of the people of color that have been inducted were inducted posthumously. Um, and I've been talking, I, I'm also the education uh, committee chair and for the, for the Illinois Aviation Hall of Fame. And it kind of broke my heart last night to see that the whole room is 60 years old or older. And I made the joke, like everybody in here could probably be my parent. And then the guy next to me was like, no, I could be your parent. They could be your grandparent. And the average age of the people in the room was probably 70, 65, between 60 and 80 years old. And um, what I want to challenge um, what I want to challenge my chapter to do and what I really would like your insight on, we have access to legends in the aviation industry and the organizations and the impact that they had over the last 50 years is something that we need help energize, creating some energy around and mobilizing them to help reach back to the current generation. Um, these are people, like Ryan said, that they never thought that they would leave the industry. Uh, they're retiring uh, now in droves. And how can we mobilize them, um, the Hall of Famers, specifically, Amy, that I'm speaking about, who have a large impact, who sometimes have deep pockets and friends with deep pockets, have airplanes sitting in hangars that they can't fly anymore, and then nobody's, there's, you, we, we know this is true, right? So, that, that's something that I, I would like to kind of have your opinion about from the National Hall of Fame. How can we 
they are aviation celebrities. And when we talk about pop culture, they are aviation pop culture. How can we mobilize even the aviation celebrities and legends who have been inducted uh, into the Hall of Fame to kind of pledge to give back to the next generation? I love this question. I get it a lot. And I and congratulations on your induction. I cannot speak for the Illinois Aviation Hall of Fame, but I can tell you about the National Aviation Hall of Fame and the changes we're making. I'm the first female leader of this organization, so I get it, I get it. And I also know, you can't see it right now, but some of you know about our friend Noah, a nine-year-old girl who I met, Angela's shaking her head. An Angela has watched my Noah stuff and I'd be happy to share it with the board. But Noah is a nine-year-old from Atlanta who got in touch with me because she wanted to do um, a, 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 she wanted to do a um, presentation on Bessie Coleman, and I won't go through the whole story because, like I said, we created a video about it. But um, she is the perfect uh, case of see it to be it because she was assigned Amelia Earhart, and she had to fight to get to do Bessie Coleman because. Um, because her, her teacher didn't know who Bessie Coleman was. And her mom went in and said, you may not know who, who Bessie Coleman is, but she does, let her do the report. She learned about Bessie Coleman through Doc McStuffins on PBS. Thank God for PBS, just saying. But, but so now Noah works a lot with the Hall of Fame and she wants to be an astrophysicist. So, you know, we get her in touch with people like Charlie Bolden and, you know, and make connections for, for Noah because we want all kids of all colors and all shapes and all sizes to be inspired by their heroes. And how can they do that if their heroes are not represented, like you're saying, Tamara. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing at the Hall of Fame is making sure that because we're guilty of the same, we've been, you know, we were chartered by Congress in 1962 and our, um, our enshrinees are, are mostly white men but they're not all white men. And we're, we're seeing also that they're astronauts, right? Or they're pilots, but we need to include the breadth of aviation. So we not only need a diversity in, in you know, ethnicity and color and um, gender, we also need a diversity across the board. So Joan Sullivan Garrett was inducted, for example, in the class of 2020. If you don't know who she is, Google her. She is completely responsible for saving hundreds of millions of lives of, as being the brainchild behind the thing that keeps you safe on an aircraft, the, the medical kit that um, keeps you safe for that. So, I mean, we just need to be better as Aviation Hall of Fame to not only induct people who have done things already, but also celebrate people like Noah, like NBAA does a great job with the Yo Pros. We need the Yo Pros in aviation, and maybe that's something your task force and our board, we really need to celebrate those success stories. So somebody like um, Mae Jameson, who's not inducted in the Hall of Fame, but we amplify her story. We celebrate her in such a way, and we have her come in. And that's the other thing the National Aviation Hall of Fame does. We bring people in like you know, who Gibson or Charlie Bolden or any of our enshrinees. And we want, we bring them in so kids can see them and touch them and engage in them because kids need to have those words and have those faces and be able to see that these are real people who have done extraordinary things. Tamara, I, I would love to have an offline conversation with you. and We could talk about this all day. I'd also love for you to become a voter on our board of nominations. Um, and I think a more diver more diversity in that also it helps expand the thought and gets people not voting their friends onto, you know, onto prominent places. You you already know that that's exactly what we witnessed last night, and uh, it's, it was no secret that they vote all their friends in and then their friends organization. So I'm I'm about to hit send because I started emailing you about ten minutes ago. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Other questions? Okay, thank you so much, Amy and Jennifer. Really, really appreciate and you know um, encourage you to continue to follow what we're doing as a task force and let us know if as we get closer to the final recommendations, you know if you if you want to add something to the conversation, um, we'd love to hear back from you both. Thank you. I'm going to steal you virtual your guidance counselor. <laughs> that's fine the more people that say it the better I mean, that's what exactly I right real. so terrific thank, thank you. you both thank you everybody yeah thanks jen all right so i've 
I missed saying at the beginning of our meeting together the, about John Hornerbrook. So you heard Ryan mention a little bit. He has resigned from the task force since our last meeting. And I'd like to take this opportunity to really thank him for his contributions. We had a, a really nice conversation as he was exiting and I encouraged him if, you know, if he hears something or, or wants to have some input just to reach out to Ryan or me. Um, you know, we really welcome um, everybody to, to, to be a part of the process. So thank you. Thank you, John, very much for your service on Expanded Pathways. Okay, I do want to highlight for everyone here today that members of the public may present a written statement to the task force at any time by sending it to the organizational email address that was identified in the Federal Register Notice. And some of you have done that, and I just encourage you to keep doing that, please. We find that feedback incredibly helpful. Um, so thank you for doing that in advance. And then uh, I'd just like to say thank you very much to our FAA support, Angela Anderson, who's always an incredible part of helping to make this run so smoothly, but also to Tweet Cooper and Aaliyah Duckett, and also Lindsay Aronson and Jack Fino, who helped to manage the technical side of our meeting today. Thank you so much. We would not be able to do what we do without your incredible, amazing help. So thank you very much. And also just a shout out again to all those ABSED team members who are sitting on our subcommittees. Sounds like they've, they've really been incredible. So thank you very much. Okay, turning it over to back to Angela. Well, just as Sharon gave a shout out to us, I would like to give a <laughs> shout out to you all because we are very appreciative of the commitment and the passion that you all have around this topic. As we all have been saying from the beginning, we have been trying to move the needle for so long. And I believe with these two advisory committees, the task force and the women's board, that a change will come about. I do believe that it still may not happen overnight, but I think we have enough of the right people focus on the right task to make it happen. And so I'm thankful, I am appreciative. I know the FA is excited and looking forward to what these recommendations will look like and trying to set up some form of structure so that when the both committees sunset that things will continue to move forward. So thank you guys for all of that. And to everyone else who is listening, um, just to keep in mind and remember that you can always go to the FAA committee website to see what the pre presentations were and the minutes from the last meeting. And besides that, Sharon, I think we did well with time. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. These are always, this is like a little oasis in our day, right? <laughs> to have these conversations. Thank you, everybody.